doctor we can start i'll start yes okay good morning friends and colleagues it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar on a novel topic robotic applications in current surgical practice amidst recent surge in covid cases we have again reverted to the webinar format today but we hope to get back to the high hybrid format that is a physical as well as webinar as soon as possible it gives me a great pleasure to announce that we will be holding our very popular multi speciality annual conference on november 6th i want all of you to please block this date and the details will be conveyed to you shortly we are holding this conference after a hiatus of 2 years because of this covid and we hope to make a grand job of it our today's topic is robotic application in current surgical practice robotics has added a new dimension in the field of surgery enhancing patient care and outcomes today we have a panel of reputed experts in the field of robotic surgery dr mufi lakadawala his name needs no introduction he is one of the pioneers in the field of laparoscopic and bariatric surgery he will be followed by dr vego vagaria dr mangesh patil dr yogesh kulkarni and dr ansumala kulkarni my special thanks to dr anil mehta for organizing this webinars on behalf of seaward medical association we are grateful to be joined by bombay medical union sir h n reliance foundation hospital gpa ff api the bombay award medical association and gen doctors federation i now hand over to dr anil mehta to further the presentation good morning and welcome to the most popular and advanced cme on first sundays of the month by the seaward medical association and a conglomerate of different medical associations we celebrated national doctors day recently two days ago and we are proud and committed to serve the mankind with preventive and curative health care using the best medical practices and regularly adopting the advances in the medical sciences today our topic is robotic applications in current surgical practice the term robotic or that is often it often mislead mislead patient patients and people robots don't do surgery it is the surgeons perform surgery using a robotic platform robotic equipments robotic arm and guide them via a console either it is done solely or it is performed alongside traditional open surgical procedures the robotic system mainly consists of three components a surgeon's console a patient's cart and a vision cart the da vinci robotic system is widely used all over the globe and presently there are four different models which is catering to different kind of surgeries da vinci si da vinci x da vinci xi da vinci sp i am sure dr lakrawala will throw more light on this we have galaxy of speakers today we have worked they have worked extensively on robotic platform and perform great variety of surgeries on different parts of the body including gi surgery and colorectal surgeries joint surgery the prostate kidney and urological system gynecological surgeries including oncology gynec onco and gynec benign surgeries we will discuss head and neck robotic surgery and heart robotic surgery maybe at some different time i take this opportunity to introduce and we start the seminar today with none other than dr mufi lakrawala who has championed the minimally access surgery he has been trained for bariatric surgery at the university of ghent hospital in belgium and at the cleveland clinic in usa by dr raul rosenthal he is also trained in advanced laparoscopic colorectal surgery by professor sion han kim from seoul korea in his 20 plus years of practice his work and contributions have been recognized with many awards like the best surgeon in the world award by the american society for metabolic and bariatric surgery 
and the Master Educator Award in by International Federation for the Surgery of Obesity in 2019. Lokmat Maharashtrian of the Year Medicine Award in 2017. He has authored a crossword bestseller, The Right, The Eat Right Prescription. He is also an honorary member of Japanese and Korean societies of surgery. The feather in the cap, he conceptualized and headed the NSCI dome COVID facility right from its inception. And currently, he is an advisor to BMC for all jumbo facilities set up for COVID-19. His academic contributions have been extensive with almost 20 international papers published in peer reviews journals. He has published a silver book on sleep dissectomy and he serves as a professor emeritus at the BYL Nair Charitable Hospital and as a professor of the Maharashtra University of Health Sciences teaching minimal access surgery. Trained a lot of fellows in many countries. At Reliance Foundation Hospital, Dr. Bufi Lakdawala is given the responsibility of setting up and strengthening the Department of Minimal Access Surgery. May I request him to start his talk on XI Robo, the application in general surgery. Dr. Lakdawala. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anil Mehta, Dr. Kamlesh. It's always a pleasure to uh, be here and speak to all my uh, colleagues. Firstly, happy Doctor's Day, though belated by a couple of days, but very, very much happy Doctor's Day. So we'll start without much ado. So Da Vinci, we've all seen this picture. All of us have seen this picture. What it basically says is that it gives you many, many more hands than you already have. As a laparoscopic surgeon, as a general surgeon, you have two hands and you need to depend on your assistance to provide the extra hands. With robotics, you've got four hands and you can, you can control them all on your own. So why robotics? I, most of the people ask me, we come to you, Dr. Saab. Robo, you do it or you do laparoscopy. We don't have to worry about it. Most people thought that, like uh, Dr. Anil Mehta just previously said, that robotics is a completely different ball game where the robo comes and does everything and the human just sits and watches. Well, the first robotic, use was report, uh, reported for brain surgery way back in, in the 1980s, in April 1985. Uh, then in April 1991, the ProBot was the first use of robotics to remove significant amount of tissue from a patient's prostate. So uh, from brain surgery, where it didn't really work, to uh, getting into the prostatic area, which now has become a common use for it to be used for any kind of renal problems, April 1991 was the, the first time it was done. Robodoc, the first use on humans was in November 1992. Then we came to the ESOP robo with FDA clearance in November 1993. Uh, again, the Robodoc got F FDA clearance in August 1998. So from it being launched in 92, it got FDA clearance in 1998. Da Vinci was first launched, launched by Intuitive and remains the number one robotic company today in Jan 1999. FDA clearance was got between Jan 99 to uh, 2000, FDA uh, Da Vinci got very, very early. The Acrobot, its first use of collaborative robotics to remove bone from a patient was in June 2001. Uh, computer motion and intuitive merge was in 2003. The TGS or the Rio Robo got FDA clearance in 2005. The Sensel FDA clearance was in 2007. And as we sit in the 2020s today, we've got lots more robotic companies. Medtronic has thrown its hats in the wind. Uh, J&J is uh, aligning along with Google to create a robot. I believe that's been pushed by a couple of years. And we also have the CMR robot, which is being currently used across India. Well, the first robotic surgery performed on the Puma 560 was used to obtain brain biopsy, like I told you, in 1985. Transurethral resection of the prostate was in Imperial College, London in 1988. Uh, once the computer motion and telescope and manipulator induced was introduced by ESOP, uh, then you had Intuitive and Robotoc both getting into the field. The first laparoscopy using a robotic system was in 1997. Uh, the first transatlantic robotic 
uh, procedure. And that is where we want to get to. Remember that if I'm sitting today in Reliance Hospital and I can operate someone in rural India, that's where robotics will eventually get to. You want this expertise of someone sitting in a, in a tertiary uh, center to operate and save the life of someone in a Mufasil area where there's almost no advanced medical facilities. And that's where I believe the robotics will get in. And my reason for getting into robotics has probably been just that. The Zeos computers uh, uh, enhance the image of the computers and you had 3D imaging coming in that time. You'll hear more from uh, Vibov later on the Sensei and the Spine Assist received FDA clearance in 2007, 2008. Over 500,000 surgical procedures were performed worldwide using the um, Da Vinci uh, Robo since 2019. And in 2000, uh, uh, over 5,000 Da Vinci surgical systems were implanted worldwide with 6 million surgeries globally. And that's the rise. If you see the rise, it's suddenly gone up. Uh, 23,000 hip and knee procedures being conducted by Marco globally. So the, uh, if he felt that robotics would not get in, today you are seeing that over half of prostatectomies and a third of hysterectomies are being performed robotically in the US. Uh, now, what is the difference between lap versus uh, robotic surgery? Well, the incisions kind of remain more or less the same. They're all small incisions, not too big. Uh, the camera is, is held by your assistant, so you don't really have uh, the help. Whereas in, in robotic surgery, you control the camera. Uh, you can control only two instruments in laparoscopic surgery. In robotic surgery, you can control three instruments along with the camera. Then there is the endo risk. That's the most important thing. And whilst I'm doing the presentation, I'll show you how that works. Uh, well, where does your surgeon stand? It usually stands in laparoscopic surgery, either between the legs or the right or the left side. And it's usually a standing surgery. Some uh, renal surgeons actually sit down urological surgeons and, and operate uh, by a sitting position. But most of the times robotic surgery, you are sitting in the confines of a, a nice chair. The moment you remove your eyes away from the console, the surgery stops. You can have a sip of coffee as well if you want. So it's all a very comfortable environment for the surgeon. The surgeon directs the robotic movements from the console and the robotic instruments respond to what you do. Uh, the surgeon operates in the instruments personally in laparoscopic surgery. Level of dexterity, there's no comparison. You have to be a brilliant laparoscopic surgeon to be able to suture well and to have a lot of dexterity and feel. Whereas uh, in robotic surgery, because the 360 degree range of motion, uh, it kind of almost reaches deep spaces which you could not reach laparoscopically can make 360 degree range of motion there. And that's why it's used in, in chest where there is a bony cage as well as in the deep confines of the pelvis for prosthetic surgery has gained much acclaim. Uh, in recovery time, well, of course, it's the same thing in both uh, because both essentially are minimal access surgeries and infection and, and wound infections are much lesser. So benefits of robotic surgery, they say it's a, definitely a more precise surgery uh, than any other surgeries we've done because it enhances the image. There's a 3D image. You have different things like uh, imaging modalities and all which I will show you in some time. And then all the advantages of costingly of a laparoscopic uh, surgery, like less pain, fewer surgical complications, reduced hospital stay and shorter recovery time. As far as the surgeon goes, better dexterity for his, uh, and it enhances the skill and definitely a better, more enhanced visual field, more control over more instruments and lesser back injuries and lesser need for massages. Now, these are the various robots. So you had from the SI robo, I'm talking only of Da Vinci because that was the number one, the CMR robots uh, and the um, a new robo which has come out from Medtronic are different systems. I'm comparing only the Da Vinci. But the Da Vinci SI system did not allow you to use um, sealants or, or staplers initially. And with the advent of the XI and the X system, uh, the XI is the most expensive. It's probably the best system that is available. It allows you to control everything 
from sealants to harmonics to the works, all right? And that is why I moved into bariatric surgery with the XI. With the SI, I didn't really move in at that point of time because what we realized is that my assistant had to use the harmonic. My assistant had to use the stapler. I was basically only using it for suturing. I never really had problems with suturing laparoscopically, so I never really moved in. With the XI, now we've done the largest series of uh, bariatric surgery laparoscopically, I mean, robotically in India. And uh, we aim to be the number one center in Asia very soon. So these are the various types of surgeries like Dr. Anil Mehta said that he performed from orthopedic surgery, uh, which uh, Vaibha will speak to you about, Gynac and Shumala will speak to you about, cardiothoracic, unfortunately we don't really have a speaker today, but we can do everything from mitral valve to pericardiectomy, to lobectomies, to tumor resections, to coronary bypass. Ophthalmology, which retinal surgery and cornea surgery is being done by robotics. Colorectal and general surgery all comes in the same space from fundoplications, Heller's cardiomyotomy to the uh, robotic gastric bypass, gastrectomy, esophagectomy, and colectomy, uh, to various uh, colonic resections, uh, whipples, adrenalectomies, everything can be done in that space. Uh, ENT, of course, you know, there's transoral surgery, skull base surgery, and various other things. Um, Thyroidectomy is again, uh, robotics gives a great tool. Urology is here to stay. Nobody even argues about urology and robotics any longer. Radical prostatectomy, cystectomy, pyeloplasties. Neurosurgery, brain surgery, after the first procedure being done uh, for a human, has really taken a little backseat and not too much of neurosurgery has really advanced with the advent of more and more instruments, I think that will pick up. Uh, pediatric surgery, of course, in Lee, there are special pediatric robots that can be used. So that's me performing laparoscopic surgery. You can see my hands, they're all twisted around, my back kind of turns around. And, and you need for different, different, like that's my, uh, uh, my assistant surgeons, as you can see, one guy's a six footer, one guy's almost a seven footer. He was one of my trainees from uh, uh, Denmark. And that's me standing on a stool to try and match up to these two guys so that everyone can adjust. Well, with robotic surgery, that does not happen. That's me on the robo sitting very comfortably, far away from the action and operating. So I don't really have the encumbrances of needing an assistant standing on different, different positions. So that's the difference between robotics and laparoscopic surgery. Well, if you see the sealant, I'll just show you a video of how the sealant works. That's how we place That's how we place. Can you hear me, please? I, am I audible? That's how the sealant works. And if you see the sealant being the endorous movement, that's how you will see the sealant also being used um, in the gastric bypass. As you can see, I'm creating the space close to the, uh, the stomach and taking care of all the vessels. That's the endorist movement that you can see clearly. You can go in very easily and use a sealant. The sealant performs the job of sealing the vessels like much like your harmonic or your ligature. It's very effective. It burns and cuts at the same time. And down you can see that you can see the vessel sealer. You can know when it is sealing, when it is cutting with the movements on your screen. So you can, you can barely go wrong. Now that's the stapler. If you can see the stapler, you'll see how the robotic stapler is far different from a laparoscopic stapler, even with the mechanized staplers that we do have today. Now you see the range of motion of the stapler. You can go complete 360 degrees. You've got various, various sensors. It senses, the, the, the computer dynamic senses at the rate of around 10,000 uh, data points per second. So you will know the thickness of the tissue, how much to fire, when to fire, how to stop from roticulation to articulation. Everything is available with the robotic stapler. And just with, with your two fingers, you can manage that. That's me using it in the gastric bypass. As you can see, that's the robotic stapler coming in. Now I will articulate it. I can twist it around. 
once it goes in, you can stapler and you can see how it goes. You can get the movement, the range, everything. And once you clamp, then it tells you, it gives you three seconds to know whether you want to fire or not. You can unclamp and reclamp again as well if you want. And then when you fire, it, you, can, you can move your head away from the instrument and the, the stapler fires on its own. It senses and cuts. As you can see, that firing is on and then it just releases on its own. You will see the staple line absolutely clean and neat once it is fired. Once it unclamps, there you can see everything on your screen, you can see it. So everything is in your control. And that's the staple line. It applies three rows of staplers on either side. And that's how it looks. Very neat, clean staple line. So there's no real issues with that at all. Then the next we move to different speeds of fire. Now, how does the robotic stapler be far different from laparoscopic stapler? Well, depending on the thickness of the tissue, like I said, this senses, and then it will fire. There you can see, that's how the staplers are, are approximated. That's how the B form of the stapler is formed. The knife cuts along. As, as you're stapling, the knife moves along and uh, cuts it. It can move in a normal speed if you've got the thickness absolutely correct or it can move in, in a totally different speed, as you can see out over here. It can, it can sense the tissue and stop. The knife is paused because the tissue is very, very thick. So it can, it can wait on and then again fire once it senses the tissue, removes the fluid so that the, uh, the thickness of the tissue is adjusted. There it is, that's the firing, as you can see. So you've got different speeds of fire as well. Now, what about the wrist movement of the instruments? The robotic arm with the arm showing the mobility compared to the surgeon's hand. The surgeon's hand can move only that much. The robotic arm can move all 360 degrees. As you can see in the gastric bypass, that's, that's me suturing. As you can see, my arm and wrist movement is very, very meticulous. I can know how much to fire and where to fire this entire thickness of tissue. I can place my sutures correctly. So the precision that you can get with robotics is far, far greater than you can do with laparoscopy. And you have to be a very, very good laparoscopic surgeon to achieve um, uh, the, the precision with suturing. But with this, of course, uh, it kind of helps because it kind of helps you. You can see that there are, that's how, the needle is placed, that's how you can fire it. You can use any kind of suture you want. That's, that's, uh, that's the precision you can use. You can, the speed at, at which you want to suture can be either fastened, slowed, so that all your sutures also lie in the perfect way, they fall in the perfect angle, so that you have no issues at all. That's the suturing of the gastrojejunostomy. Now remember, this is bariatric surgery, so patients are usually 140, 150 kilos, and uh, however heavy the patient is, with the robotics, what happens is that you don't feel the resistance on your arms, and uh, you, can, you can do this much, much more easier. That's the jejunotejunostomy. Usually it lies below and the suturing becomes difficult. So uh, with laparoscopy, with, with the robotics, again, whether it's end-on or side-on, because your arms can move, both your left and right arms can move equally. That's the VLOC suture. So don't even have to really uh, go through and, and lock anything. Once you pull through, you've completed your suturing. That's the advantage that you do face with uh, the robotic suturing. So precision with suturing is very, very much a part of uh, any robotic uh, instrument. Now, uh, what else is the advantage? Well, the advantage of uh, robotics is that you can switch on to a firefly mode anytime. 
Now we do have this technology in laparoscopy as well, but you have to inject a dye. And then you have to wait for that much period of time. Sometimes if you're too early or too late, you miss the, the contrast getting into the bile duct or the blood vessels and you can't make out. Whereas once you switch on and switch off to the firefly mode, you can see your bile duct, you can see the cystic duct. So the injuries on the, on the CPD have been minimized with this firefly technology. And you don't need any dye to kind of switch over to do this. So that's the advantage even in basic surgeries like the gallbladder. Now you can identify all your structures, so the, the chance of something going wrong is much, much less. Now, there was this paper published in Laparoscopic Advanced Surgical Technique, Adopt or Abandoned, Surgeon-Specific Trends in Robotic Bariatric Surgery, Utilization between 2010 to 2019. So the adopters were surgeons who were the highest utilizers of robotic bariatric procedures, the abandoners, the surgeons who stopped performing robotic cases despite demonstrating prior use. The adopters performed a higher proportion of gastric bypass, both robotically and laparoscopically when compared to abandonment. So they did both. So all the top surgeons in the world have switched over to this because they find the use of both the robo as well as laparoscopy in their range of patients. The robotic bariatric utilization has been increasing over the years only because the patients are heavier and heavier and the surgeon kind of gets the comfort with the robotic. Robotic adoption may be influenced by certain specific preferences based on procedure specific volumes according to the cost out over here. So what we've done at Reliance is we've diminished the cost so that we can serve our patients far better. And that's why we today remain the number one center having done robotic gastric bypasses in India and the second in Asia after a Chinese center. So this is a, a published paper on robotic Ruamai gastric bypass surgical death technique of short-term experience of 329 cases. Um, there were more female patients, the mean age was 36, mean body mass was 44.8, and our average mean body mass that we operated Reliance is around 45. The mean console time was 94, so their time gets shorter and shorter with experience. So it takes you around 35 to 40 cases to really shorten your time. And the docking time has become far better with the XI because it can kind of adjust immediately. Patients were discharged within 48 hours of stay. Our patients are discharged the next day. Uh, no 30 days mortality, no anastomotic leave, no surgical side infection or intraoperative complications in this study. Um, then in terms of the sleep gastrectomy in morbidly obese versus super obese patients, as you can see, these are docking times were under 10 minutes. Um, they, they sutured because it became easier for them to suture. In, in the super obese, again, it took them that much time, not too much time. Blood loss was minimal. Uh, so nothing really significant in terms of between the super obese and the morbidly obese in terms of uh, a technique with the robot uh, uh, in this patient. The evaluation of outcomes of robotic bariatric surgery. This is taken from the American so Society for Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery database, which is the MBS AQIP database. What they uh, noticed is that uh, between 2015 2017, the significant values in terms of robotics were in terms of the 30 day readmission rate that came down, 30 day intervention of robotic surgery came down. The serious advanced events in the robotic group came down only with more and more experience in, in terms of the robotic bariatric surgery. Now, robotic versus laparoscopic bariatric surgery, this is a meta-analysis. There was no difference in the incidence of overall complications between robotic or laparoscopic. So if you were to ask me, the forest plot depicts a similarity in both. What is the difference? Well, there's not much of a difference, but as we move into the space of uh, more and more 5G technologies, uh, there will come a time today as I speak to you, Ben, and I'll be able to sit here and do a complicated case of someone sitting in Delhi. And that's my overall aim of getting into robotic surgery. So there is always this saying that when a new technology rolls in, you can either be part of the road roller or part of the road. You have to choose who you want to be part of. Again, if you see this forest plot, it was a significant reduction in the incidence of anastomotic reek with the robotic bariatric surgery. Now, these are all surgeons. So with the expert surgeon, you believe that maybe the leak rates might be the same, but with uh, all surgeons coming, uh, then when you want to teach, we've noticed that the incidence of 
uh, leak with the robotic pediatric surgery is much less only because the suturing becomes that much easier. Now, elective robotic assisted pediatric surgery, is it worth the money? Well, if you see the direct cost of robotic uh, sleep gastrectomy is higher than with a laparoscopic with no added benefit. The direct cost of robotic surgery was higher also with Ruama gastric bypass. But the lower readmission rates kind of dictated that approach. And what they found in the US, readmission was far, far more expensive. At least in the case of a Ruama gastric bypass, it made more sense to do it robotically than laparoscopy, quite unlike in the sleeve, which is a less complicated procedure to start with. Now, uh, if you compare laparoscopic versus robotic bariatric metabolic surgery outcomes in five years, over 800,000 patients, the percentage of sleep gastrectomy and gastric bypass done robotically has doubled in the last five years. The robotic sleep gastrectomy is associated with a higher risk of infectious complications than laparoscopy. That's what they believe. But the other paper showed the same risk. Patients have higher readmission rates with laparoscopic surgery than with robotic surgery. So robotically assisted revision of bariatric surgery. This is where it really counts in because revisional surgery is always more complicated, more difficult. The range of motion that the robo offers is far better and it can give you much, much better. So 99 bariatric revisions done using robotic. The average BMI was the same. The overall complication rates were relatively the same in, and there was no leak or hemorrhage observed in this study. So revisional bariatric surgery, what they, they had, the primary outcome was early complication rate. The secondary outcome was operative time, conversion to open length of stay. What they concluded basically in this study was that the meta-analysis showed no significant advantage of robotic bariatric, but no worsening. So it was a non-inferior efficacy study. So it showed that though it didn't worse, the worsen, it was almost similar to the results. Again, uh, in this paper from Philip Morel and his group, if you compared revisional robotic bariatric surgery, you saw that the hospital stay was lesser in the robotic uh, than in open or laparoscopic surgery. Uh, the duration of surgery, of course, Lee, was much more with the robotic, but the complication rates were zero as compared to those with laparoscopy or open surgery. The short short study, but it shows us some early indications. This again, all talks about revisional bariatric surgery. The weight loss is more or less uh, similar, not too much of a difference uh, at a two year period. Now this is wherein uh, bariatric surgery was used along with uh, robotic kidney transplantation for morbidly obese patients with end stage renal failure. And we get a lot of these. We get a lot of patients who have diabetic related nephropathy, some of them are cirrhotic, and there is a combination trial that is going on even at our center of doing a liver transplant along with the bariatric surgery or doing a kidney transplant along with that, especially in morbidly obese patients. And they show that there's not too much of a difference in terms of outcome, and uh, it's, a, it's a great option to be done. So traditional laparoscopic surgery, the surgeon gave verbal commands, the assistant surgeon acted on those verbal commands. There was visual information feedback with this, with, between in, in the operative uh, team, and the surgeon could directly manipulate the, canu, uh, the movement in tra traditional laparoscopy. The current robotic surgery, the surgeon uh, handles the camera movement and, the, uh, like I said, three instruments with direct manipulation. And what the envisioned future of robotic surgery with AI and everything else comes is, there'll be an autonomous camera controller so that the surgeon can then handle more instruments and robotic positioning and training will come from sensor movements. So everything will become much, much more. You will have MRI images, CT scan images juxtaposed with your operative images. So if for those of us who feel that robotics is just a little more expensive surgery to do the same thing, which I can do so easily, it's like those surgeons talking about open surgery and saying, I do a mini lap, how is it different by doing a laparoscopic surgery? They are obsolete, so will the, the laparoscopic surgeons if they don't adopt to robotics in the near future. The first, first obesity surgery performed by a surgeon at a distance. Well, this is what I'm talking about, telesurgical procedures, all done from a distance wherein someone sits miles and miles away 
from you. And the first one has already been done as a trial basis and was published in the obesity surgery. Now, telesurgery. Telesurgery is here to stay and we need to, uh, with the era of more and more digitalization coming in, the main utility of telesurgery is ability to overcome the limitations of conventional surgery, namely the geographical uh, inaccessibility of rapid and high quality surgical care. Especially in India, where there is so much of rural and tribal healthcare, we need to get this um, highly advanced surgical sphere into our, our domain. There is always going to be a surgeon shortage. There's always going to be expertise shortage. There's always going to be logistical limitations. But as India moves into the space of 5G technology, I believe these things are going to be uh, a path that is going to be followed very, very soon. This technology benefits both the patients and surgeons, providing technical accuracy and provide provision of high quality surgery in medically undeserved locations, especially in some of the rural areas, battlefields, wherein the surgeons and the doctor team doesn't really have to be in a battlefield, but perform very, very advanced surgery. Uh, then the master and slave consoles for training. So you have a surgeon with the assistant surgeon being there and the surgeon can take control anytime to teach his junior without actually uh, harming the patient. So that's the master and slave console concept just coming in. This is how I normally tra train at Nair Hospital. Look at the number of su uh, surgeons who are watching me operate. I do uh, some laparoscopic training at Nair Hospital, but this is the modern day training. He's sitting on a console far away from that and telling the surgeon how to operate. And this is how tele-robotic surgery will, training will go in. And that's how you can train surgeons in rural areas, even not physically being in the same space. That's what robotic surgery will offer. Then metaverse. All of us have heard of the word metaverse and we associate it with Facebook's transfer to uh, this new thing. But intuitive surgical uses the option of virtual reality. Now, I have bought myself a VR set and uh, trust me, training and uh, everything has moved into that space. Now we have uh, a firm called Iris, which is an AR form, which puts an augmented reality imaging solutions for training more and more people. And you have outcomes. You will know how a surgeon is improving, how a surgeon is worsening. You have all the companies from Stryker that has partnered with Microsoft to use the latter is HoloLens to render 3D imaging of operating theaters. This is how surgeons are training nowadays, all right? So if you thought this was sky fi well, this is technology today. This is how surgeons are being trained from orthopedics in the space of uh, knee replacements. Uh, the new training labs are like this and the new training facilities are like this. It, it can, in a space of a room, of around 400 odd surgeons. It can also tell you which surgeon has done the best with algorithmic put in. And, and you have no, uh, no more cadavers and stuff like that, but you have the real feel of a 3D operating surgery with just uh, these kind of VR virtual rea reality tools. So from data analytics being used in machine learning to machine learning, to the connectivity of the modern day to advance visualization, surgical robotics will move at a very, very fast pace. So we move from open surgery to laparoscopy to now robotics. The time is to get into digital surgery, which I believe in the next five to 10 years, you will see every surgery being dictated and controlled by the AI platforms that will come in and tell you that if you cut here, you might go wrong. If you don't cut there, you might go right. So that's how all the modern surgery will move only to maximize quality and value of care, enhance technological use and augment care providers. You will have being calculated. So you won't have people going to court to try and find out whether the surgical surgeon did something wrong because already your digital uh, dynamics will dictate a lot of the things from all these various data that is getting, going to get in from patient care pathways to data sources and various other things. Uh, the, the new modern age surgery will completely change from what we are doing it today. Trust me, friends, 10 years later, that we are completely driven talk, which will be completely AI driven. We've gone from freehand surgery to minimal access surgery to robotics assisted surgery. Surgery with full automation is the goal. And I think we will reach there in 10 years from now. Thank you so much for a patient listening.
So I it hopefully is. stuck to my time. Yeah, but it is spellbounding. I know the so. So you can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, Dr. Lakhanwala, you did a splendid job. In fact, like using a endo risk on in a robotic surgery, you have actually given us a three sixty degrees bird eye view to the entire what is right from the beginning of the robot to what is going to be the future. But I pray God that at least not like Tesla, that there will be drivers without drivers car. At least the surgeon should be there on the scene all the time. So anyway, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your time also, and thank you for giving us a real good future. And what are we going to witness in next two decades, one decade rather? So thank you very much, Dr. Lakravala. We move on further. Now, as we discussed, that there are a lot of organs, different organs, and different uh, uh, systems of robots uh, we can use. So we have Dr. Vaibo Bagadia with us. Right now, he's likely to be, you know, going for another lecture, but he's going to be here for a, for the opening remarks. Dr. Vaibo Bagadia is consultant in the Department of Orthopedics in Sir H N Reliance Foundation Hospital, Mumbai. After completing MBBS and uh, the Dr. Bagadia completed MS at K M Hospital. He pursued orthopedic fellowship at uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, USA for a year. During that fellowship, he received two international awards and also diploma from SICO, Belgium. Then he underwent fellowship in advanced joint replacement and adult reconstruction in Germany and later on in Perth, Adelaide and Melbourne in Australia. He is the first Indian to top the international diploma SICO exam. Dr. Bagaria gained experience in all latest technologies in orthopedics at different centers of excellence around the world. He is proficient in performing most orthopedic surgeries with special interest in hip and knee replacement procedures. He is specialized in hip and knee revision procedures, hip resurfacing, and unicondylar knee replacement surgeries. He is well versed with the latest technology like minimal invasive surgery. Computer navigated service surgeries and patient specific instrumentation. So, may I request Dr. Bagaria, and then we will go on his recorded uh, 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 meet speakers meet. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anil Mehta, for that kind introduction. It's always pleasure to be among our own people, uh, and thank you the entire association for giving us this opportunity. Dr. Mufi's lecture has set the tone for robotics, and as he said. That robotic is gonna touch every aspect of our lives. I'm sorry, I'm I, I'm forced to present uh, as a recorded lecture because I'm giving a lecture at Nanavati very shortly. So you'll have my recorded lecture, and then I will probably join if there are any questions. So thank you once again, and uh, uh, requesting Dr. Anil Mehta to kindly play my recorded talk here. Thank you so much. Okay, Sara, can we play? Good morning, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be here on this Sunday morning to attend this webinar on robotic application in current surgical practices. At the outset, I would like to thank the president of the organization, Dr. Kamlesh Shah, and the scientific convener, Dr. Anil Mehta, for giving me this opportunity to present on this very important topic. We all know that robotic is changing the way we look and today i will be talking specifically about orthopedics many of you here know me i work at sir h n reliance foundation hospital and i specialize in hip and knee replacement surgeries and this is the hospital that most of you are familiar with as i said in the very beginning of my talk that we all are aware that this shift is happening and it is happening all around us whether it is teaching whether it is surgeries whether it talks about automated cars, but we all know that we are surrounded by newer and newer innovations close to our working place, close to our homes, our kids. So everything that you see around us is experiencing a paradigm shift. But why healthcare? We all are also aware, we've been skilled clinicians and we've been aware that there is definitely a need for improvement in how we practice our healthcare. And when I talk about knee replacement, our patients are by and large very happy with the procedure. 
over what we have done over the last few decades. But there's still a subset of population who are unhappy. And this is directly related to the stability and proprioception. And we also have certain surgeries in which we are not able to give 100% and they end up being revised. And these revisions were mainly due to alignment and instability that is there during the surgery. And it is this quest, in this quest of excellence in where we want to not only maintain what we have done but to exceed our parameters that our um, search for newer and newer technologies happen and today if we look we have got a robotic technology that has evolved from conventional instrument so when i talk about knee replacement surgeries conventional instruments were the one that started in the very first phase then we went to early balancing tool then the navigation habit happened we moved on to early robotics which are primarily surgical guide which were helping surgeon execute things accurately and today we have got handheld robotics which is largely image free and from this image you would come to know that almost every orthopedic company which is making implant is foraying into robotic technology so on the top you have got the johnson johnson wireless then we have got striker which gives mako smith and nephew has got uh, navio and cori in their um, armamentarium whereas QS is an open source system and Zimmer has Rosa. So these are the top five major orthopedic company and all of them have invested heavily in the robotic technology either by themselves um, uh, doing R&D into the field or acquiring companies which were pioneers in robotic. Now let's return back to PKR or knee replacement surgery. We all know that the surgeons are mechanical goal when we are doing a robotic knee replacement is to restore alignment. We want to make the leg straight. We also want to have the natural anatomy. So we want to preserve the joint line. We need a good balance, meaning the pressure on the inner and the outer side of the knee has to be equal because that makes patient feel really nice and also increases the life of our implant. Of course, uh, aligning the um, or uh, uh, putting the components in right position is one of the keys and we also want the kneecap to track centrally but we also have an additional goal like in all surgeries we want to have an optimal surgical time if we spend too much time in theaters there's high risk of infection blood loss and of course our that's also a surrogate indicator of our surgical skills we want decreased infection rate we want pain to be reduced we want our patients to go home earlier and we want at the end of surgery, the surgeon and its team should feel happy. So in all aspects, we don't want too many inventory, too much hassles, too much steps which are not required when we are doing surgery. And we want any system that we buy to be cost effective. When we look at the surgery per se, there it is in any surgery is divided into three stages. We do pre-operative planning, then we do intraoperative changes, and finally we execute the surgery. I at Sir H. M. Reliance Foundation Hospital work with this particular robotic system called as Cori, which I believe is one of the finest robotic system available today. Um, this is how it comes. So at the top you'll see the eyes of the robot and then this is the instrumentation set and the finally down below is the executing tool. The steps in robotics are very standard. One, the first step is setting up followed by registration, planning the implant, bone cuts, validation, trial implantation, revalidation, cementation and closure. So these are the steps and I will briefly show you an animation for how the robotic surgery is done. So this is the Cori system. So this is the console of the Cori and these are the eyes of Cori. And this is a tab that is there on table which we have, uh, which we have access to as a surgeon. So to orient robot, we have to give it certain direction. So we put these pins so that the robot gets oriented in time and place. Okay, okay where, where am I handling? And these are two checkpoint pins that we place. This is to ensure that intermittently we can check if anything has moved. Because you'll understand everything works on positioning here. The robot uh, doesn't have a real time feed. So again, I'm registering different points and telling robot what is where. 
so i have collected both the malleoli then i'm telling the knee centers this is a way to tell the hip center then i'm collecting the range of movement and then this is the fun part we paint the femur that means we tell this is how the shape of a particular person is there so you'll see that this tip that is being um, put on the bone is the sensor tip so it is kind of collecting the data and all the data is transmitted with the help of those blue disk that you saw to the computer console and here is where the planning is happening so once i've planned i'm seeing how the gaps are and then i make fine changes to the component positioning so in different planes i can see how it is doing as i said intermittently we check whether things have moved during the operation and this is the executing tool so this is the handheld bar which is running on the bone and the best part of this robotic is that it only cuts to the area that has been defined so all the pink area that you are seeing is more than 2 mm cut the green is one and white is where the cut has to happen so it aligns it in three planes sagittal coronal and axial plane and finally we do the trial implantation to see whether we have achieved where we started from or not and you see it's a perfect balance here okay. so again as i said this is how the process starts bit technical the key steps in robotic is registration and orientation of robot planning and execution of cuts so this is how the registration happened this is a live patient that we did at hn reliance hospital it is registering all the birth sizes the setup involves a few steps in which the birth is arranged and again once again the whole thing is oriented to the console surgeon scan make preference so you'll see that this have exposed the knee have cleaned up we'll see that the joint is quite damaged and arthritic i'm putting two pins above i am putting now the pins down and once that is done the camera registers the knee in different planes so once i have done that then as shown in the cartoon there or in the animation there i will start collecting the important landmark after putting the pins so you see medial malleolus lateral malleolus the screen is prompting me what to do so i'm collecting all the landmarks which the computer is asking me to do i am moving around to correct the hip center so all the boxes have to turn green collect the range of movement and then i paint the femur so this is literally doing kind of taking all the input to create the model you'll see how fast the computer is recognizing and i must credit engineers who have developed this software because it's incredibly accurate and incredibly fast this video is running on twice the speed that i am doing so you can imagine how fast the models are being created in real time when i'm doing this it's only at 2x speed just to shorten and ensure that our timing of presentation is maintained once i have done the femur then i come to tibia again the same thing once uh, this is the axis for the femur then i come to the tibia so putting the spike and then mapping out the tibia so you see it's important to collect all the points because the more points we have more data set we have the more accurate the models will be created and more accurately we will be able to execute the whole thing so this is at the end of this we reach what's called as planning stage then once we come to the planning stage it is this at this point that we reconfirm our philosophy on how we want it and uh, what needs to be done and we we can make a crude implant changes at that point this is how the implant planning soon looks like and then i move it through the range of movement to see where and how the knee is behaving at different stress range so we can do it without stress you'll see that this is how it is coming and then we can do with stress 
so in both the plates we are seeing how much the joint is opening so it gives us an idea once that is done then what is i called is the heart of the operation which is the goal setting and where you will find the surgeon and the artificial intelligence work hand in hand it is here we set non negotiable and negotiable term we negotiate to win win so as a surgeon my whole idea is to ensure that we i balance forces all across the joint and you'll see that different surgeons have different philosophies about alignment and balancing and the philosophies have changed over the years so you'll find at some time the surgeons were saying 1970s people were talking about mechanical alignment then they came to anatomical alignment then kinematic alignment adjusted mechanical alignment and this is the era of intelligent alignment and i think that's where the medicine is headed we will find every time different people dogmatic about their approach but ultimately it is about the patient it is not about what surgeon thinks and that is where we will come to in every sphere of medical practice where what is right for the patient what is the intelligent thing to do for patient will vary from patient to patient and once you have an objective data at hand you will be able to execute it to what is correct for that particular patient so again this is bit technical and many orthopedic surgeons will love this because it's meant for them this is what i call non negotiable in which i don't compromise with robot or no matter what he says and there are certain thing about uh, the whole exercise where i call it negotiable where i and robot can talk about this is the planning screen where we look at the medial lateral cap and by tweaking various parameters of positioning i try to maintain this whole uh, balance thing in more accurate way and then uh, you will see that how i am changing my uh, whole um, position to ensure that where i want so people who if they are orthopedic surgeon will understand that what i have done is cleverly change the varus valgus at the tibia and the femur and ensure that this graph reaches a normal value so you will see all little little changes are happening there real time so that i can get my knee completely balanced so you will see that now the gaps on the lateral side are now coming close to zero so so one advantage with this robotic technology is that you can talk about sub millimeter or millimeter level of things okay and once that is done we go to the execution which is standard you will see that this is how it is done so we once again confirm our checkpoints and uh, then once the checkpoints are reiterated this is the robotic arm i told you in my um, earlier slides that um, wallet is more than 2 minute cut and then we gradually just ensure that this cut is uh, done so again it is coming cutting at sub millimeter level so the robotic arm comes out and goes so the robotic the bar comes in and comes out and it is ensuring that only the portion that is defined by what needs to be cut is being cut and not a millimeter more is cut so all the white thing is where it has reached the point and it will not cut even if i want to it will not move and the moment it touches the soft tissue again it stops so it's a it ensures the safety of our operation because it will not cut any soft tissue and it will cut the bone only to the level where i want here i am setting up the rotation and once the, that's done the same thing is done for the tibial side also so once that's done we go to what's called as trial and gap management so this is i am um, putting the trial implants in and then i put the spacer in and move it through the range of movement just to ensure that everything is all right to see the balance what i had planned is correct or not so we'll move it through the range of movement once i have done that you will see that i'm just moving it through the entire range of movement i'm feeling it manually i always do that it's a double check and then we move it seeing the range is good or not and then we'll just move it completely through the range the computer will track all that and finally what is most important is this slide where it shows that balance is equal on the medial and lateral side in both flexion and extension which is i think the most important thing when you are doing a knee replacement so the key point here is we must know where we want to go we must master the technology and do not become its slave faster accurate and minimalistic should be the goal 
आई ऑलवेज ए पिक्चर अभी बाकी है पार्टी तो अभी शुरू हुई है सो रोबोटिक थिंग्स आर गोइंग टू टेक ओवर इन ऑलमोस्ट ऑल स्पेयर ऑफ मेडिकल फील्ड वेदर वी लाइक इट और नॉट सम एस्पेक्ट्स आर नॉट ट्रूली क्लोज टू आर हार्ट्स बट येट इट विल हैपन एंड वील बी स्पॉइल्ड फॉर चॉइसिस a bit of technical point here on how i look at my happiness scale after the operation i want a good alignment good balance good component positioning and minimal releases and if you look at how i used to think this is where i wanted to be and um, this the bull's eye was when i balance and line would were bang on most of the time my skills and experience would get me to here so i was here traditionally but if you with robotics i have moved very closer to the bull's eye and in these example you will see the difficult valgus knee patients balanced out accurately uh, with almost less than 2 mm difference in medial lateral side which is really good for such cases this is the post op x ray second one is a simple straight forward varus knee again same thing you will see that this is how the gaps and the positions were this is how the gaps were this is how the gaps were after stressing final implant positioning we tried for this and this is the final graph again post op x rays are very good so you'll see that it is not only important just to execute this we also uh, work towards research in it and there are at least 10 research uh, ongoing research on robotics in at, at our uh, hospital at hn reliance foundation two publications have already happened so we enjoy working and i think the real fun is when you actually you enjoy it and that brings me to the last question will and should robot replace us and i've cut replace us because it's half and um, i really like this advertisement in which the robot was free to offer the aspect of this so thank you and whatever we do we should do it the what alone not alone it is only worth it when we can enjoy it so just to conclude technique technology and teamwork are all elements critical for success and optimal patient outcome newer technologies help achieve our desired outcome more efficiently and accurately robotic for knee replacement has brought about a paradigm shift in the way we perform our surgeries it forces an average surgeon to think plan and become better and a good surgeon to become even better by introspecting and adapting at the heart of all this all my talks all are this uh, venture all this cme is to ensure that we excel in the field that we work in technique common sense and good team are essential for the success and as i said picture abhi baki hai the best is yet to come however having said that i also would want to say the best way to predict future is to create it by doing research by being part of innovation and i really thank all of you for your kind attention and encouraging such academic events at our um, um, institute and at your organization so thank you very much i'm open to any questions that you may have and um, you may drop me an email at drbagaria@gmail.com d r b a g a r i a gmail.com or visit me at sir h n ryan foundation hospital for any questions regarding robotic knee replacement thank you very much so dr bagaria this was a wonderful i mean all round view the only question which i had in my mind which you already addressed that will it replace us that's the question <laughs> so I, i think sir whether we like it or not we are heading in that direction uh, to a large part but if we can at least hold on to the fact that the we will be the decision makers i think executions will be delegated the decision making will still remain with the clinician because they understand the entire thing that robot may not understand at least for next 3 4 decades i would love to be and i foresee myself to be decision maker the execution will be relegated when it is always say like like driving a car we got better roads we got better car we got chauffeurs to drive us we have got automated cars now but eventually what is important is to know where to go and till the time we are the people who know where to go everything else will be only our aid the day we give that responsibility to take us where they want to take us i think we'll be lost 
No, I fully agree with you that the 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 first two steps where you are setting up the goals and when you are registering it, that is the key to the entire procedure. Mm -hmm. If you don't do a good feeding to the computer, the outcome won't be good. So it is your intelligence, yep. it is your goals, it is your setting up, your thinking, and uh, your expectations from the out of the surgery is more important. Then the AI, well, let's wait for the AI, what it does in the future. So it is nice. Yes, so we are moving on to the third one now. See, the urological system is the most important. And in fact, if you hear and if you recollect what Dr. Mufi Lakravala said, that the urology was the first one to, you know, the urinal system who started the robotics. Because the prostate was situated right down in the... Uh, in the deep in the pelvis and the difficult accessibility and uh, uh, surgical fields, etc. So then the T uh, this uh, robotic surgery has really made a difference there. So now let's hear from our third speaker, Dr. Mangesh Pati. He is a consultant at the Department of Renal Sciences at HN Reliance Hospital and Research Foundation. Dr. Mangesh Patil pursued his DNB from PD Hinduja Hospital after completing MS General Surgery from GMH, MH Nagpur, uh, GMCH Nagpur. Sorry. He trained at the Roswell Park Cancer Institute, New York, in robotic surgery. He has, till date, performed 290 robotic surgeries, including prostatectomies, nephrectomies, cystectomies, and radial. Uh, 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 hysterectomies. He also specializes in la laser TURPs and renal transplantation. So may I request Dr. Mangesh Patil to enlighten us on the urological applications of the robot. Uh, uh, good morning and thank you so much uh, Anil Mehta sir for such a kind in, uh, introduction. Thank you so much Seaward uh, Association and Reliance Foundation Hospital for giving me an opportunity to talk. Many of you uh, must have heard about robotic surgery uh, in urology in my talks or uh, some other speakers. So today I'll be briefing about the uh, how the robotic surgery has uh, developed and how it has, uh, it has been accepted most in urology. So uh, I think as uh, Dr. Anil Mehta sir rightly said, uh, the uh, the the start was in urology and probably urology has been the most uh, important branch to accept robotic surgery uh, sir i'm sure uh, my screen is vis visible and my uh, voice is clear thank you so much sir so today i'll be talking about robotic in urology uh, now this picture reminds me, uh, I attended a conference in Dubai and it was, there was a stall which said that robots will replace most of the day-to-day -day needs. Now this is a robot, uh, of course this was around two and a half, three years back and we can see these kind of robots in practice or in reality also. You might not be surprised at Reliance Foundation Hospital, you will see such moving robots to help patients or relatives to give information, to uh, get the uh, details about the doctors, procedures and everything. So, uh, to, so let's, let's see how robots have influenced us. So basically robots, they have, uh, as Dr. Lakadawala also mentioned, and of course, Dr. Vaibhav in a different field uh, in orthopedics, uh, both are uh, impressively said the robots or the AI will influence our surgical practice. Now it has become increasingly important in the field of surgical interventions. Now probably because of growing complexities of the procedure in difficult cases and of course greater demand of minimal invasive surgery. Now Surgical robots, basically, they are the electromechanical devices. Now, everyone is aware how they work and what are basic indications. But great geometric accuracy, precision, which is guided by computer algorithms through the sensor systems. The incisions are small. 
the uh, the reach of the robotic instrument is is sorry easy in a difficult uh, anatomical areas especially as dr mehta mentioned about the prostate prostate is situated way inside the true pelvis and reaching with the fingers or hands is very difficult so uh, the reach with a robot is much better now it reduces the procedural time blood loss and of course it it eliminates the complex uh, extension of the procedures but i mean do we have to choose surgical robots over traditional surgery so my uh, say on this is let's see what are the benefits are there benefits to the patient are there benefits to the surgeon benefits to the hospital so to the patient definitely the incisions are small incisions are small so naturally uh, the pain will be less the recovery will be quicker cosmetically they are better especially for females uh, and we can give smaller scars which can be hidden in undergarments uh, the blood loss is less so the patients recover quickly and most of them don't uh, need icu backup or icu transfers they resume early so of course their work life also can be resumed early and of course results clinical outcomes are in fact better than uh, uh, open or laparoscopic surgery but does it limit to the patient it definitely benefits to the surgeon as well how surgeon is benefited is the longevity of the surgeon is extended especially those who are senior uh, surgeons uh, aged surgeons who have the knowledge but they are uh, because of the age factor or because of the tremors they they cannot perform the complex surgery now here tremor filtration is an advantage of robotic surgery where a senior surgeon who is knowledgeable but not able to perform uh, accurate surgeries can be done with the robot the design of the machine is ergonomic now what is the meaning of ergonomic is we can adjust the page, uh, the console or the patient side carts uh, according to the need of the surgeon's physique a tall surgeon may need a taller console or a small surgeon will need a shorter one so those things can be adjusted i'll show in the next video about the ergonomics it is a better teaching tool because uh, a senior surgeon or an experienced surgeon can be a mentor to a junior or a new surgeon and without doing much complications we can do the similar or same surgery with accurate results any benefits to the hospital yes initially everyone thought that robot is a costly instrument and and of course it is a costly instrument but does it help in having a financial benefit yes so especially i can tell you at reliance foundation hospital we are struggling to get beds or the rooms people are waiting for 2 to 3 days for the uh, getting the bed but of course quality always is preferred so people are ready to wait but that can be reduced with a minimal invasive surgery so rapid turnover of the beds early discharges and happy discharges can make the patients come for different surgeries the relatives come for different surgeries in the future and of course it adds to an armamentarium that every technical aspect can be taken care under one roof so patient doesn't have to go to other uh, hospitals for investigations or treatment now the unique advantages of robotic surgery over traditional or laparoscopic surgery are a three dimensional vision now three dimensional vision gives a depth perception so naturally the surgeon gets better vision naturally he can perform better an endorist movement endorist movement is a movement at the wrist joint now in laparoscopy uh the movement is the hinge is at the skin level but in robotic surgery the hinge is at the wrist so it exactly copies the human or a hand movement ergonomic design as i mentioned and of course greater range of mo motion or dexterity uh that's a graph which shows uh the outcomes of robotic prostatectomy and i'll be proud to say the blue the dark blue color 
mentions my uh, results. It's not boasting anything, but I'm just comparing the results with American surgeon, the purple one, or a Da Vinci surgeon. Of course, in open and laparoscopy, the comparison is between four different surgeons. And you can clearly see the length of stay is equivalent to American or a European surgeon. It is much better than open or laparoscopic surgery. Blood transfusion rate, the surgical site infection, and stricture or complication rates, they are much lesser or almost equivalent to a better or a well-trained surgeon in America or a Europe. Now, why I'm showing this graph is earlier there was a thought that complex surgery, hai, cancer surgery, hai, we have to shift the patient to America or Europe to get a better result. But it is not like that nowadays. More than 10 to 12 years into robotic surgery, I can assure the results will be better or at least equivalent to a well-experienced surgeon in uh, foreign countries. Uh, similarly, the, uh, the elaboration of the description. Now, uh, initially, Dr. Mehta sir mentioned about the number of surgeries. I'm so sorry, I could not update the, uh, the profile, uh, but uh, I have fortunately completed more than 850 surgeries so far. 850 robotic surgery is a decent number and gives a decent confidence. Now, out of which most of them are radical prostatectomies, which more than is almost 550 radical prostatectomies, radical nephrectomies, partial nephrectomies. These are the core of the robotic surgeries. Yes, cystectomies, that is bladder cancer removal with ileal conduit or neobladder uh, can, be, can be done. Uh, and of course, uh, being a pelvic surgeon, I can perform a robotic hysterectomy, of course, with a gynecologist, but the planes or the anatomical dissection is much better with robot. Of course, reconstructive surgeries like pyeloplasty, ureteric reimplantations, uh, of course, diverticulectomies can be done. And few of the patients, we have done benign prostate hyperplasias. Uh, which are having larger prostates, like more than 150 gram prostate, they need uh, robotic or laparoscopic prostatectomy. Now, that was a standard indication of robot and robotic surgeries. But are we ready for complex procedures or two procedures in one surgery? What I mean is there was a patient who, uh, who needed a surgery for prostate cancer and kidney cancer together. We could have staged it, but we did it in the same sitting. Of course, there is a RCC with pheochromocytoma, bilateral partial nephrectomies, radical hysterectomy with retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, ureterolysis. All these surgeries can be done with the robot in one sitting. That adds to the faster recovery and lesser um, complications. Of course, there are extended indications in urology, like bilateral retroperitoneal lymph node dissections, synchronous malignancies like kidney, prostate, adrenals, complex reconstructions like ileal ureters, neobladders, transuretral ureterostomies, IVC thrombectomies, uh, complex intrahilar renal tumors for partial nephrectomy. Without losing the kidney, we can remove the uh, remove the uh, tumor and of course suture even the vessels can be sutured the renal artery or renal vein can be sutured uh, with the robot endophytic renal tumors they can be done uh, with intra uh, i'll show the photographs multiple renal tumors simple prostatectomies and salvage prostatectomy so that was the ct scan of the patient who has a prostate cancer we can see a uh, hypointense lesion in the prostate peripheral zone on the right side. And of course, there is a mass in the prost uh, in the kidney. You Can you appreciate uh, this? There is around four by four centimeter mass in the mid pole of the kidney. And that was the photograph of the patient on coming for a follow up for suture removal. You can see the absorbable stitches have given just a single line. And these three, like three, five, six are for the kidney tumor and one, two, three, four are the prostate uh, surgery. So one was pelvic surgery. This was the kidney surgery. Now, earlier we had SI model of the robot 
and now it is replaced at reliance foundation with xi model now with the xi model the advantage is we can we can do both the surgeries without change in the docking we can do the surgery just tilting the patient on one side we can do the surgeries without uh, losing the time and as they say time other different indications are a large or difficult partial nephrectomy as i said a intrahilar tumor if you can appreciate the kidney these are small black dots which are angiomyolipomas and this is a large angiomyolipoma with a hematoma or a hemorrhage inside you can see the renal artery lifted completely and sorry and uh, the intraoperative picture showing a large vein crossing over the renal tumor and the ureter being dissected away from the tumor so this dissection is without much blood loss and quite accurate doesn't happen in laparoscopy of course open surgery we can feel the tissues and we can do it but open has a lot of morbidity larger cuts loss of blood and shifting to icu so this patient was from middle eastern lady i mean middle eastern lady and she was discharged on seventh day without any complications i'll quickly go through a, a, a video uh, which shows how we do partial nephrectomy uh, with the help of robot so this was a 30 year female and it was a symptomatic incidentally detected renal tumor incidentally detected renal tumor and the uh, it was a right sided tumor uh, these uh, these structures are like liver upside the ivc you can see the blue structure which is lying vertically uh, running from uh, the lower abdomen to upper and we can see the kidney being dissected now uh, the the kidney is usually surrounded by gerota's fascia and when we are doing a partial nephrectomy we have to dissect the whole kidney to to uh, to locate the tumor as well as to dissect cut it and suture the tumor so suture the remaining kidney uh, the most vital structure during the dissection will be the hilar vessels renal artery and renal vein as well as the ureter if it's a lower polar tumor we are very careful about the possible injuries to the uh, the ureter now here we can see the ureter running uh, from the hilum to the uh, uh, near the lower pole we can see the renal artery the pulsations and the renal vein now with the laparoscope or open surgery this kind of movement around the vessels is actually scary and we may not dare to do those movements but with the robot accurate movements we can definitely handle the vessels much better and uh, without damages to the vessels we can see the instruments moving inside in a swift manner the vascular uh, vascular um vascular loops across the hilum the renal tumor you can see the mond or the bulge of the tumor and uh, and we have to dissect the renal uh, fascia so the the dissection around the tumor and the gerota's fascia is being dissected i'll skip the video partly to show the tumor being dissected we can we can clearly see the tumor now what we do is we do a surface marking over the kidney parenchyma and we we just plan the surgery like the area where we are going to cut now this is assisted by intraoperative ultrasound if we we have an intraoperative ultrasound with us uh, we can definitely make sure that we are not going through the kidney parenchyma and once the surface marking is done the most important step will be to clamp the vessels a kidney is a vascular organ 
and if we try to cut the kidney directly it can cause torrential bleeding and within few minutes the whole blood may uh, may be lost uh, with the vessels being injured so here we are clamping the renal artery and the renal vein to minimize the blood supply uh, to the kidney and then we start cutting the cutting the parenchyma of the kidney we can see the normal kidney parenchyma we can see the and this whatever blood loss is hardly 5 to 10 ml to in all blood loss we have removed the tumor we can see the swift movement of the instruments the needle through the parenchyma so that the proper hemostasis is achieved the pc system sometimes if it opens we have to suture it so that uh, the urinary leak complications are minimized it's a watertight closure so that i fortunately none of uh, my patients had a urinary leak and we make sure that the sutures are tightened properly there will be a bolster which is placed to cause additional hemostasis so that we don't lose any blood post operatively and fortunately we haven't transfused the blood in the post operative period also so that's the bolster being placed and uh, it it just adds to the hemostasis at the operation site we tighten the sutures so that we don't uh, we don't have any complications of bleeding as well as urinary leak once this is done the bulldogs are removed what we do is we remove the uh, vascular vascular clips or what vascular ligatures and place the tumor in the in in a in a polythene bag which is impermeable to cancer cells and that's the final picture of partial nephrectomy we can reperitoneize the uh, tissues and it it causes minimum scarring to the intestines that's the size of the tumor around 3 and 1/2 to 4 cm and it was a cystic rcc all right so that was a quick video of how we do a partial nephrectomy uh, i was mentioning about the intraop use of ultrasonography and the ultrasonography helps in finding endophytic tumors especially those which are not visible on the kidney surface radical nephrectomy is you can see the glistening surface with the gerota fascia intact and the the tumor uh, which is almost invading the uh, the renal hilum a uh, radical nephroeritrectomy is uh, where we don't have to change the docking the kidney the ureter and the part of the bladder can be removed comfortably without change of the robot uh, pyeloplasty is one of the reconstructive uh, surgery which is actually having complications like scarring at the operation site if not done properly you can see the ivp where the right side doesn't show any uh, dilatation but left side is dilated and showing the stones in the pc system now when we open the pc system we can do a flexible scope and we can pick up the stones uh, with the uh, with the scope and we can do the suturing over the stent a large prostate uh, which was more than 240 g we have removed sorry we have removed it with the help of robot and we have techniques which color uh, different tissues and we can definitely make sure that the margins are negative uh, again similarly how we dissect the posterior bladder neck and a large prostate of 240 g 240 g is quite a large and it is as good as the size of a bladder again similarly another large prostate which is almost occupying the whole whole the pelvis and with a malignancy and at the end result is such a wonderful or beautiful anastomosis between the bladder and the urethra uh, a quick uh, video i'll just skip most of it adrenalectomy for a pheochromocytoma uh, the most worrisome uh, point here is intraoperatively fluctuations of the blood pressure but 
during this case not a single episode of fluctuations in the blood uh, blood pressure and that's the adrenal adenoma which is almost 3 and 1/2 to 4 cm we have done the dissection after putting the ports we retract the liver that's the adrenal kidney liver and i'll show the uh, the uh, i'll skip most of the video you can see the yellow uh, tissue of the adrenal gland and the cystic mass that's the uh, dissection between the liver and the adrenal mass and that's the adrenal vein the worrisome structure here is adrenal vein because right side it drains into the ivc and that's why we are scared so how we place the clip and there are robotic clip applicators which are much accurate that's the robotic clip applicator and we have placed a clip and cutting the renal vein that's the mass which is uh, being dissected and not a single episode of that's the adrenal tissue with the mass not a single episode of uh, fall or increase in blood pressure during surgery we just see the hemostasis and we are done that's the pheochromocytoma uh, so an another complex surgery is a radical cystectomy with eel conduit where we can see the cutting of the intestinal muco uh, intestinal uh, wall and placing a stapler so uh, the staplers can be used to anastomose and do the conduit making and that's how we do the neo bladder as well where the true pelvis we can see the true pelvis uh, the anastomosis is being done with the urethra the intestinal loop is being sutured to the urethra that's another indication is robotic inguinal block dissection or it is specifically known as wheel procedure uh that's a saphenous vein and inguinal block dissection being done so the major challenges during robotic surgery are higher installation cost of course now it is reducing gradually but yes that's one of the challenge robotic malfunction is very rare and to date only one case i had where we uh, we had a technical problem but which was sorted out by technical team learning curve is shorter than laparoscopy but yes Uh, we need a training for at least 20 to 30 cases and of course availability of the robot now to conclude the talk i'll say all the complex surgeries can be done with a ease with robotic surgery precise removal of the tissues reduces the possibility of local recurrence as well as injury to the surrounding structures it is less invasive so naturally quicker healing minimal scarring and less risk of infections in prostatectomy the damage to the nerves is less so naturally sexual functions can be regained with the robot early a uh, single incision laparoscopy is coming up and it is being developed so it might replace the multi port uh, robot cost definitely is a constraint but uh, most of the insurance companies are now accepting robotic as a standard and overall i will say uh, robotic surgery has many advantages over laparoscopy and open surgery so it will definitely uh, gradually uh, completely replace the traditional and open uh, traditional and laparoscopic surgery thank you so much uh, thank you dr patil fantastic and a uh, good overview of the urological system uh, i will also request now dr bharat bhat who is the president of our general practitioner association and recently we have successfully completed our diamond uh, platinum jubilee no sir golden jubilee golden jubilee golden jubilee we uh, celebrated in a very nice way under the guidance of dr bhat so dr bhat you please take over now and uh, also if you have any comments so far what we have completed the three uh, topics no thank you dr anil mehta for your kind words and i thank all my team for the great success of my golden jubilee conference anyway i mean i always like to make my talks lighter all the speakers were too good and excellent so everybody said you know pain minimum bleeding minimum hospital stay minimum scar minimum but nobody talked about the cost being minimum so i am just waiting for that day when the cost also becomes this is just to make it 
light, but otherwise I know, you see, I am closely associated with a uh, robotic team of uh, Kokila Ben. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Yogesh Kulkarni, whom I know for more than five years, who is a gynec oncosurgeon at uh, Kokila Ben. And he specializes in ovarian cancer, cytoreductive surgery and fertility preservation. Now he began his medical career as a lecturer at GMC, that is Grand Medical College, GS Medical College, that is uh, KM Hospital and Wadia Hospital. And later on, he joined Tata, where I think he had both wide exposure and experience. And I think that speaks because I have seen him uh, performing the surgery and all. He has given me excellent results. So along with the standard gynec obstetric surgery, he went, to be, went on to become a minimal access surgeon and ultimately he has become a robotic surgery. So this transformation, I always compare because I am a cricket buff. So to be a, see robotic surgeon is like a T20 player. So to be a good T20 player, you got to be a good test player and then ODI 50 overs and then you become uh, what you call a T20 player. So without, I mean, talking much of taking much of your time, I mean, he has been an author of few chapters in various textbooks. He has various national as well as international publication. And today he's going to speak on role of robotic surgery in gynec cancers. Over to you, Dr. Yogesh Kulkarni. I, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, Dr. Mehta, Dr. Shah, and the entire Seaward Medical Association. It's it's been a pleasure to be invited and a privilege to be a part of such wonderful conference. Uh, without wasting much time over the next 15-20 minutes, I would share where do we stand in terms of the role of robotic surgery in gynecological cancers and what we as, as a team Kokilaben have achieved over the last eight to ten years. So I just give me permission, sir. I'll just share my screen. Okay, carry on, Yogesh. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, to start with, I mean, you know, when when we look at surgery from a, from a broader perspective, surgery is basically causing an injury, obviously with a specific intent, and and the only way surgery as a specialty can evolve when you reduce the extent of injury, you reduce the complications and the morbidity that is associated with surgery. And that is obviously without compromising the outcomes uh, for the patient. Uh, the same evolution we have seen in cancer surgery. You know, I have been in Tata Hospital and where uh, initially there was always used to be a talk as, okay, today I remove this, this, this much. Okay, or, or the whole focus was on what you have, what you have removed. But I think we have moved on from radical resection to organ preservation. So today we ask ourselves a question in a cancer patient, what can I preserve? The same thing has happened. We have moved on from open surgery to minimal access surgery. May not be in all cancers, but whenever it was possible, feasible and safe, you know, we have tried to move on from open surgery to minimal access surgery. And the whole idea of this was to have faster recovery, less morbidity, improved quality of life, but most importantly, not suffering the outcome, especially in cancer patient where it matters the most. Minimal access surgery in gynecological cancers, we have both laparoscopy as well as robotic assisted uh, laparoscopic surgery. Uh, I think I won't highlight the advantages of minimal access surgery. We all know in terms of hospital stay and incision and less blood loss, better visualization. I think they have been time bound and proven advantages of minimal access surgery. And this is roughly the timeline of how minimal access surgery evolved in gynecological cancers. So in 1987, the first pelvic lymph node dissection was done. In 1992, the first laparoscopic radical hysterectomy was done. Then, you know, there started the trials which sort of compared open surgery versus laparoscopic surgery in endometrial cancer. Uh, in 2005, the FDA approved robot, uh, the Da Vinci surgical system for uh, gynecological, uh, you know, indications. 
2008, there was another trial started. Most importantly, there were two results which came. In 2009, the LAP2 trial, which compared the outcome of open versus laparoscopic surgery in endometrial cancer, and 2018, the results of laparoscopy versus open surgery in cervical cancer care. And, and these every timeline or this every event has actually modified the way we look at minimal access surgery in gynecological cancer. Now, whenever there are new surgical approaches, be it a new surgical instrument, be it a new surgical technique, be it a new surgical approach, what we as cancer surgeons have to look at is what are the what is what is the oncological outcome like? You know, are the recurrence rate comparable? Is the overall survival or the disease-free survival comparable or worse with minimal access surgery? And last but not the least is surgical endpoints. You know, are we resecting adequately? Are we not compromising just because we want to do it minimal uh, minimally invasive? The lymph nodes count. This can be a surrogate marker to evaluate whether you are doing the right things and correct way and in a complete way. And last but not the least, the safety for the patient. So there were always doubts about, you know, use of minimal invasive surgery, uh, you know, in terms of its acceptance, you know, are we removing the nodes, uh, you know, the surgical margins are good or not. There is no data. There is always a risk of dissemination and the port side metastasis, which was considered to be a big concern at one, of, one point of time for uh, cancer surgery. But, you know, a lot of trials over a period of time have sort of reduced this, at least for endometrial cancer, where the recurrence rate are exactly the same. The overall survival is exactly the same between open and laparoscopic surgery or minimal access surgery. And the risk of outside metastasis was less than 1%. So the biggest advantage of uh, minimal access surgery uh, is there in terms of reduced morbidity and we are not compromising the outcomes for our patients, especially for endometrial cancer. So with the current available evidence, I would suggest that whenever possible and feasible, minimal invasive surgery should be offered in selected cases of gynecological cancers. Now, everybody would ask why robot-assisted laparoscopy? When do we have, when we have conventional laparoscopy and laparoscopic surgeons available? Because unfortunately, you know, the conventional laparoscopy is not widely used. That's what the data suggests, you know, because there are a lot of things, you know, it's technically challenging. The learning curve is far more steeper. The instrumentation is rigid. You know, you have reduced depth perception. The surgeon's positional discomfort and fatigue, especially when you are doing long surgeries, difficulty in achieving adequate instrument triangulation and two-dimensional visualization. Obviously, we do have uh, 3D laparoscopy, which are available now. So I am not saying that laparoscopy or robot are at loggerheads with each other. I think we have to look at lapros robotic surgery as an evolution of conventional laparoscopy. And five years down the line, you know, there might be something, the AI may be introduced or something, and the robot that we are using may go out of the field. So I think we have to accept it as an evolution rather than looking at it as a challenge. So what I feel is, you know, with the current use, there was a very limited use of conventional laparoscopy for complex surgery. And this was a survey done in 2009, which had analyzed over 2 lakh hysterectomies done in the United States. Only 14% of them were done laparoscopically. So that was the use of laparoscopy, even when the laparoscopy was a well-established technique. Now... So the same thing is you have a lot of surgeons with basic laparoscopic skills and there are some excellent and outstanding laparoscopic surgeons our city and this country has and will be seeing. They have, they have exceptional skills, but unfortunately, modern medicine cannot be at the mercy of certain exceptional individuals. You need to find a technology that will bridge the gap, that will allow more people to use the minimal access surgery. So even though you have 10 brilliant laparoscopic surgeons, they won't be able to cater the need of 1.3 billion population. So you need, and if you are not able to train enough advanced laparoscopic surgeons, we need to bring in a technology that will bridge this gap and allow more people to use minimal access surgery. And that's where the Da Vinci, Sur da Vinci surgical system come into play. We have to look, as I said, as an evolution of minimal access surgery, it is not a competition to laparoscopy. 
and it's a technology which is both patient and surgeon friendly patient friendly because it's minimal access surgeon friendly because whatever difficulties the surgeon faced in conventional laparoscopy the da vinci surgical system have tried to address at least a few of them so you are better off and in better control of your uh, instrument with the da vinci system so this is you know the overall system the patient the, this this is the robotic cart this is the surgeon's console and this is the vision cart i won't run this video so when i have to look at advantages of the da vinci system you know three dimensional vision there is an excellent magnification what i love most is the degree of motion and the endoris instrument i think that allows you to work in close approximation with vital structures without being worried of injuring them. and and the the value of robotic surgery lies in its faster learning curve you can easily move on from open surgery to robotic surgery the learning curve is much less as compared to conventional laparoscopy it is it is easy uh, it allows easy anatomical dissection reproducible steps it is especially useful in patients who have high bmi and it is first time you know there is a computer interface between the surgeon and a patient i think all other specialties in medicine computers have infiltrated surgery was probably the last one and this is the first step towards using having a computer interface between surgeon and patient and the biggest use that biggest impact that the robotics uh, system can have i see is that it will increase the use of minimal access surgery so lot of people who were good laparoscopic surgeon who were not doing complex uh, uh, surgeries laparoscopically would be able to do the same surgeries with comfort with ease with lesser learning curve using the robotic platform now here i am just running two videos one is an open lymph node dissection uh, that we have open pelvic lymphadenectomy that i am doing in, in the upper video and the lower video is 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 the robotic uh, uh, platform that i am using and i am i am i am putting these two videos simultaneously just to show that what what i want from an equipment is that what i learned from my open surgery i should be able to replicate that while i am using that platform and i fortunately with the with the endoris instruments you are able to do exactly that and that's what excites me most about about the da vinci surgical pad so here you can see i am using the monopolar cautery here uh, to do the lymph node dissection along the external iliac vessels and here we are using the robotic platform and here you can see i am this is a monopolar cautery which we are using and we are using it very safely without any fear close to the blood vessels because which we normally won't use in in laparoscopy because you won't have that the control on the tip of the instrument using laparoscopy in laparoscopy most of the times you would be using a vessel sealing instrument or maybe using just a blunt dissection to to dissect the tissue so if you see you can you can see the external iliac artery external iliac vein is completely cleared and i i i am sort of trying to match these two a match these two videos step for step just to give uh, everybody an understanding about how comfortable it is uh, you know to do a laparoscopic uh, to to do a, a robotic surgery especially when you are working in close approximation with structures like blood vessels or ureter so here we are clearing the obturator fossa that's the obturator nerve there here you can see the internal iliac vein the obturator artery and you can see the, exactly the same way i would be doing an open disc so so that that sort of that completes my point as far as why we should use more of robotic because it allows you better control on your instrument so that that's my biggest uh, you know sort of argumentative point in terms of using the robotic assisted platform where do we use it in gynec cancers i think endometrial cancer is the most common indication cervical cancer was but i think after the 2018 trial i think there has been large doubt uh, casted over role of any kind of minimal invasive surgery be it laparoscopy or robotic surgery in cervical cancer because the studies have proven a grossly inferior outcomes when you are using uh, minimal access surgery in cervical cancer 
so as of now i have stopped uh, doing uh, robotic surgery or laparoscopic surgery for cervical cancer we have done excentrations we do groin node dissections sometimes we do restaging surgeries and we were the first center to complete two radical tracheotomy which is a fertility preserving surgery uh, for cervical cancer where you actually only cut the cervix and preserve rest of the uterus so that the women can conceive again now endometrial cancer this is probably the indication uh, for uh, robotic assisted surgery because surgery is the primary treatment for c endometrium majority of the patients are obese and have medical comorbidities uh, paraortic lymph node dissection especially in obese patient becomes a challenge with a conventional laparoscopy and right now we also have uh, a sentinel node sampling or sentinel node mapping uh, which is an image guidance that allows you to avoid extensive lymph node dissection in in select sub group of early endometrial cancer so this is the profile of general endometrial cancer patient that we see these women generally have high bmis they have obese they have previous laparotomies and it become a open surgery i think your residents are going to pursue for next 15 days because they will have to keep on doing the dressing laparoscopic surgery your assistants are going to pursue because they will have to retract and you may still not be able to achieve is probably the indication for for using the robot and why do i see that because in studies have proven that if the bmi is more than 40 and if you are doing a conventional laparoscopy there is a very high chance that the surgery has to be converted to open because you won't be achieving the adequate surgical end point and the morbidity is especially high in patients who have underwent this conversion so i think obese patients especially is a strong strong indicator uh, to have a robotic assisted surgery now this is our experience with endometrial cancer we started the robotic surgery program in 2012 uh, till now we are, uh, as as a gynecological cancers you know anshumala will speak on benign uh, gynecological cases but uh, total number of gynecological cancer cases we have done are about 520 the endometrial cancer cases have as i said have been the bulk of those cases we have done 415 patients uh majority of them had previous uh, have comorbidities and previous surgeries and this is the bmi distribution and almost 20% of our patients had bmi which was more than uh, 40 this is our timeline how we moved along along with our timing so uh, from 70 to 80 minutes for hysterectomy currently we stand around 35 to 40 minutes Uh, for pelvic lymph node dissection again we stand at around 30 to 35 minutes but for paraortic lymph node dissection being an extremely difficult uh, procedure to do robotically we still require about 70 minutes so a patient who requires a hysterectomy pelvic lymph node dissection and paraortic lymph node dissection the total consult times comes to about 2 and 1/2 uh, to 3 hours these are our uh, parameters in terms of blood loss hospital stay the number of lymph nodes retrieved uh, we have had only 2% only 9 patients were convert uh, had to be converted to open surgery uh, because of multiple reasons sometimes they were not able to tolerate the head low sometimes the bowel were just not getting retracted you know sometimes uh, there was problem in terms of accessing the blood vessels or there was too much of uh, uh, mesenteric fat that were not allowing free movement of the instrument we had about 11 intraop complications you know some blood vessel injuries or or sometimes there is a bowel injury post operative complications were seen in about 7 uh, patients now here i am i am showing two uh, videos one is uh, is a sentinel node mapping and and the second video is paraortic lymph node dissection so i want you to have i just to save time i am running both this now this is the area where you have you are extremely worried you know because here you are dissecting close to the aorta and the inferior vena cava here you can see that's the ivc and here we have given the endosci i'll i'll show this to you a bit later till we complete this so here you can see this is the aorta and i am going and dissecting behind the aorta to take out the lymph nodes which are behind the aorta So, and i think these kind of movements only uh, the robotic platform will allow you I, i i think you know this you can do comfortably only with the help of robotic platform here you can see the entire ivc completely bare 
the entire aorta completely bare. You have you, you can even go on behind the aorta to lift the aorta and the lymph node behind. Here the IBC can be lifted and the entire bunch of enlarged lymph nodes were removed using the robotic bag. And this is where I feel, uh, you know, the robotic surgery helps us at its best. Now, this video is about, you know, using the robotic platform or the sentinel node mapping when you actually don't need to do an extensive lymph node dissection. So here we give an endocyanin green dry and, and then the first lymph node which follows the path we follow the lymph node and take out the lymph node and, and, and send it for frozen section. Only if that lymph node is positive, we go ahead with a complete lymph node dissection. Otherwise, we just stop the lymph node dissection procedure there. So what it does is it, it, it allows you avoid unnecessarily lymphadenectomy and associated morbidity in about 80% of patients. So here you are, you can see the, the endocyanin green, the track and the lymph node. You remove the lymph node, you check once again that you have removed the right lymph node and move. Then you go to the other side and again here you can see uh, the lymph node clear cut mapping uh, uh, as a very bright green tissue, which is seen with the near infrared camera, which is a part of the XI as well as the new X system that we have. And then you take out this lymph node to set. So the thing is, you can do this lymph, this video suggests that you can do an extensive surgery if you need to, and you can do minimalistic surgery if you need. So that's the spectrum that the robotic platform offers you from doing an extensive lymph node dissection to doing a sentinel node mapping. All these things you can use, uh, you can perform using a single platform. So that's where I feel the value of, uh, of the robotic surgery uh, lies for us. Uh, I think I, I, I will uh, cut off this uh, thing because I, I have stopped uh, doing uh, uh, robotic surgery for radical hysterectomy. But this video, I just, when we were doing it, I found the robotic platform to be most useful in one of the most crucial part of radical hysterectomy, and that was the ureteric dissection. And, and, and ureteric dissection, is required even for some of the cases of in benign gynecology as well, like a severe endometriosis or, or a bad uh, pelvic adhesions. And I think the robotic surgery with its flexibility, you can preserve the uh, vasculature of the ureter and dissect very close to the ureter without having much of an issue. But as I said, you know, till a better evidence comes, currently we stand at no use of robotic surgery for uh, uh, cervical cancer. The other procedure which, which I am I'm, I'm, uh, very happy to discuss and, and one of our videos of uh, this groin node dissection is a part of the European Society of Gynae Oncology training videos. Uh, that's the role of uh, robotic surgery in groin node dissection. You know, the vulval cancer is extremely rare. Surgery is basically radical vulvectomy plus inguinal lymph node dissection. And, and the biggest problem with the groin node dissection is the wound breakdown, okay? So that's where uh, uh, the, the robotic groin node dissection procedure has come. I think my colleague, Dr. Yuvraj, uh, used it for penile cancer, and he was the one who proctored me to use it for vulval cancer. So here you are using four ports, rather than normally we would take an incision here, and there was always a risk of flap necrosis. So I, I think I am running short of time. So I will uh, skip the video. So learning curve for the robotic platform, yes, it has a learning curve and then there are different aspects of learning curve. Uh, the incision to docking time, that's part of the entire team that you have from your sisters to technicians to assistants. Then there is a docking time, which is basically part of you and your assistant and the console time, which is basically your responsibility as a surgeon. I think for a setting of the equipment, docking, it's about 20 cases. Each component will obviously have a separate learning curve and that where it highlights the importance of having a stable team with you all throughout so that you know things become much easier as you move. But as far as operating time, what I have observed is they, after 20 procedures, there is a significant improvement in operative time and blood loss. But I think you need to do about 50 cases to be confident, comfortable, and assured about yourself in terms of performing the procedure in a stipulated period of time with a stipulated blood loss. There are 
limitations. There are physical limitations in terms of uh, bulky instruments. You have larger port sizes. And most importantly, especially for gynecological cases, you have very limited vaginal access. And doctor, as Dr. Bhatt rightly pointed out, the cost, <coughs> I think the cost is coming down and will come down. You know, we are, we are the people who have paid 16 minutes per, 16 rupees per minute for incoming and outgoing calls for mobile phones. And now we are not even paying 16 paisa. So I think the more and more uses is the cost is definitely going to come down. And that's what at least I hope for. So to conclude, I would say technology is neutral. We all have to use it with sound judgment, with full understanding of its limitation. So it has to be a balance of technology the individual skills and the case selections and the outcome will take care of itself. If we don't do that, you may have the best car in the world in terms of the Bugatti Veyron, but if you don't use it on the right road, you are likely to get stuck. So as long as we understand the limitations of technology, we are ready to shake hands with any technology that comes out. I, I thank you all uh, for a patient hearing. And once again, thanks Dr. Mehta, Dr. Bhatt, Dr. Shah for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Watt, your comments? Okay. Uh, so it was wonderful, Dr. Kulkani, but just I wanted to ask only one question. Where are you parking your Bugatti? <laughs> I don't have, sir. I wish I have one. <laughs> that, that, that was somebody I, I, I wish you the best. It was a wonderful presentation. And in fact, in fact, I would uh, you, you know, very nicely explained, uh, though the system is the same, but today the speakers, they have explained their own different field in a very nice way. So though we know the basic things that their blood loss is minimum and minimal access, etc. But each, each and every organ has been a specific one. There were specific indications. So it has been a wonderful experience all throughout. So thank you so much, Dr. Kulkarni, and I'm uh, uh, enlightened for this. And now we have Dr. Nisha Kushlani, the award medical association president with us. Doctor, uh, you are taking the real task of a before lunch <laughs> introduction of Dr. Anshumala. Anshumala, you have left South Bombay. We are not happy with you, but do welcome on our screen. Thank you very much to come on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Thank you. Uh, firstly, good morning, good afternoon now, everybody. Uh, belated happy Doctor's Day. Thank you very much to Seaward Medical Association and specifically Dr. Anil Mehta for giving me this huge honor and privilege of introducing Dr. Anshumala Kulkarni Shukla. I know her on a personal basis, so I was extremely thrilled to have this honor. And whatever I'm going to be saying, it's like a candle to the sun. But please, uh, yes. <laughs> Huge honor, ma'am, to introduce you. She is the head at the Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital and Research Center with specific interest in uh, gynecology, laparoscopic, and robotic surgery. Ma'am is an MD, FCPS, and DGO. Uh, ma'am has trained at Australia and Singapore. Yes, and earlier she was practicing in South Mumbai, and we definitely miss her presence uh, in uh, South Mumbai. I wish uh, she were here more. But anyway, it is not Mumbai's gain as, <laughs> as well as our loss. Ma'am has been the Young Achiever Award in 2013, voted the Mumbai's top doctor as well in 2013, top doctor in 2016 in gynecology and robotic surgery, faculty for AAGL and IAGE annual conference. She has trained over 50 doctors under her. And she's going to be speaking on benign uh, gynecological uh, surgery. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see you virtually, at least, Nisha. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Uh, pleasure to meet you always. Uh, and uh, thank you, Seaward Medical Association, for this opportunity to speak about a topic which uh, I think was a game changer in a lot of ways for minimal access, considering laparoscopy has been our standard in benign gynecology. Of course, uh, Yogesh has enumerated uh, the various uh, benefits of doing robot-assisted surgery in gynecological cancers. And I think when patients are uh, facing a, a situation of death with regards to cancer, it's always associated with death. They get very worried and they are ready to uh, you know, uh, listen. 
but when it comes to benign gynecology uh, it is really hard to be able to tell a patient that why do you need robot assisted surgery and you know uh, every there will be other people who will be doing laparoscopy open surgery so many things so many options are there and uh, the journey of me starting robot assisted surgery in 2012 to date has been basically about not only convincing them but convincing myself as well as to why a robot will be a game changer in this i just like to share my screen please thank you Is my screen uh, visible now? Yes, please. Right. So uh, we are looking at uh, uh, robot surgery program in gynecology at Kokila Ben Hospital. We know the miracles of modern technology. Ever since uh, we probably used uh, did not use the robot uh, the remote control and had to manually switch channels on the television. And we all know that less is more. I think there is no debate about the fact that if you can do laparoscopic surgery, it's always going to be for the better of the patient. however robot assisted surgery offered as a way of doing this in an even better way because the visualization was far better our instruments were far better and the patient benefit uh, though at the outset possibly was seeming to be a little indirect because uh, patient was uh, going home in two days time but had less pain less bleeding which was not very with not very quantifiable and the initial thought process always was that it is good for a surgeon the surgeon can do it better but i would like you to uh, to go through a certain indications of using robot surgery in gynecology where uh, you know this is actually truly uh, made a very big difference we are uh, quite a big number of people across india who are doing robot assisted surgery very regularly and uh, the procedure growth has been phenomenal ever since uh, it was probably started in 2011 uh annually as well robot assisted is now very well accepted and uh, the rate of complications throughout has always been uh, seen to be lesser as compared to doing uh, uh, laparoscopic or, or uh, open surgeries our milestones uh, in our hospital have been such we started in 2012 and we now stand at 2022 where uh, we know that uh, we are having a very wide range of uh, uh, indications as well as number of cases that we are being doing we have completed almost 700 plus cases in uh, gynae oncology as well as benign gynecology with uh, mainly uh, focusing on three areas in benign uh, subject one of them being grade 4 endometriosis doing multiple myomectomies where it's a complex myoma which is involving multiple uh, myomectomies multiple sutures uh, doing surgeries for pelvic floor repair now sacrocolpopexy is one of the things that probably is very uh, commonly done for pelvic floor repair however there are a lot of other uh, methods of doing this particular surgery we have used it for hysterectomy myomectomies endometriosis tubal recan uh, and uh, we have a certain amount of benchmarks we were the first in india to do pelvic floor repair surgeries like sacrocolpos and uh, uh, levator and repairs now timeline point of view always whenever you do a surgery you always want to look back to see whether you're doing it as good as what you were doing before or is it actually getting better there are certain international benchmarks of how long should it take for you to do a hysterectomy how long should it take for you to do a myomectomy sacrocolpo and we are uh, pretty much in line with what we used to do with the help of laparoscope as well so the robot actually did not necessarily take longer time as it was uh, initially thought to be there so you know there were a lot of myths about robot assisted surgery that it was very time consuming the docking would take more than 20 30 minutes it was a very long learning curve uh, you know it's very expensive and what if the robot fails what if the robot doesn't know how to do so it was always a question of are you trying to convince me or are you trying to convince yourself when i was talking to my patient uh, but i as as the time has gone i would say we cannot really compare apples with apples they are pretty much an extension of what we used to do with laparoscopic surgery and it is more of an enabling technology uh, where uh, we are actually allowing ourselves to do better and more complex procedures uh i have used it uh, in all of these uh, fields and these are my uh, data with regards to how long it uh, as compared to laparoscopy what is the level of robotic assisted surgery are done unfortunately the numbers are still uh, pretty much goes with laparoscopy simply because insurance was not always with us on our side and you know it is it is an extent extended amount of cost that a patient has to pay however consistently robot assisted surgery is slowly growing over a period of time uh we hardly do open surgeries uh, major surgeries still remain laparoscopy 
but there is no limit to uh, adopting it. The best part about robot assisted surgery is the ergonomics. So you can see, uh, this is our oldest version, the SI. We have three robots in Coquilabin, SI, X, and XI. So here, the beauty of the robot, the, the console is that you can move it to adjust to according to your height. So you are not really, uh, you know, struggling over a very obese patient, over a very thin patient, over a very complex surgery. When you're standing in a position which is not very ergonomic and trying to do a surgery and give your best output. So this actually is an extremely ergonomic uh, place and uh, it has an immersive environment. So we have 3D laparoscopy as well. So why would you want to use robot assisted if I can do 3D? I can see 3D. But that 3D is still got an interface. You're wearing a, cam a, a system wherein you're going to look at a screen which is going to be away from you. In robot assisted surgery, this is an immersive environment. Literally, it is like when you look into the console, you're looking into the patient's abdominal. So you are doing open surgery. It is the feel of doing that surgery is an immersive environment. The whole perspective of how the pelvis looks is very different when you're actually looking in like you would do an open surgery as compared to looking at a screen, though albeit it might still be a three-dimensional, it's a very uh, different way. The console times has only improved over time since the time we started in 2012. We found that our number of time required for doing myomectomies or a hysterectomy has actually consistently coming down to under, 30, uh, under uh, 100 minutes, which is almost one and a half hour only. And uh, that uh, essentially is an indication to say that with time, you can improve our results. Of course, pelvic floor surgery, as you can see, the number, the time required to do the surgery has increased, but that is because we're doing more complex surgery, the video which I would like to show you. So we all have um certain steps in learning to do a certain something wherein you don't want to do something wherein then you want to do something and then going on to do yes i did it and have the confidence to be able to do it in uh, endometriosis particularly robot assisted surgery has an advantage of giving you a very clear three-dimensional vision uh, we all know that endometriosis is no longer uh, bracketed as a disease which is occurring because of endometrial lining growing on the outside of the uterus. The whole concept of endometriosis has changed to, uh, it is an inflammatory lesion, which is similar to the uterus lining, the endometrium. It reacts to hormones, but it is not the endometrium, which is growing outside the uterus. And the key area of actually getting good results of doing an endometriosis is surgery is by doing what is called excisional endometriosis surgery. This is more so important if you have a deep infiltrative endometriosis where you find rectum adherent, ureters adherent, you have the hypogastric nerves adherent. Now, when you're looking deep into the pelvis, I think uh, the whole uh, part, the fact that the robot allows you to go right into the pelvis gives you a very clear vision and your instruments are very, very fine. You don't need any uh, high profile, just monopolar and bipolar energy sources are more than enough to give an excellent outcome as long as you know what you're doing in that particular thing. Our experience with the endometriosis has been uh, quite good in that terms. We have had only one ureteric injury in a patient who had a repeat endometriosis surgery uh, after uh, initial uh, surgery done outside and one bowel injury in someone who had a grade for endometriosis. But overall, if you see the number of cases that we have done, uh, the outcome has been very good in terms of pain relief as well as in terms of fertility uh, sparing. We have used the ICG. Dr. Kulkarni spoke to you, Rogesh Kul spoke to you about the ICG dye that you use for doing sentinel lymph node mapping in, uh, in endometrial cancers. However, we can also use this ICG dye to look at endometriotic uh, nodules on the pelvic floor. So we inject the ICG in the blood and then we use the green filter to look at vascular lesions, which may be hidden. So you know the depth of how far the lesion has actually gone in because ultimately success of an endometriosis surgery will depend on how good the excision process is happening. And that is where uh, this makes uh, a very big difference. So you are able to identify the subtle endometriosis with better visualization and you can precisely excise the entire nodule off. A few studies have been done to the use of ICG in endometriosis where they found that the uh, amount of uh, retrieval of endometriosis is far more if you use the ICG as a guide to do your endometriosis surgery. Uh, that's again another uh, study that had been done to look at what is the thing. So here, Cameroon Nezad, he's the father of endometriosis surgery in the world, who's actually compared robot assisted versus laparoscopy. And according to him, he uh, has agreed that those patients who have a stage three or a stage four endometriosis, the outcomes are far better if you use a robot assisted surgery because your excision is going to be more complete. You're able to dissect and identify uh, the lesions much better if you use uh, the robot assisted surgery. Uh, coming down to hysterectomies, of course, simple hysterectomies 
are very well easily done either with the help of laparoscopy, vaginal surgery, V nodes assisted surgery, which are uh, you know easily applicable to doing these kind of surgeries. However, there are some hysterectomies where you might find that you have a previous surgery. So you have say a previous endometriosis surgery and you're doing a laparoscopy for uh, a hysterectomy for uh, a previous endometriosis surgery or the patient has had previous multiple myomectomy surgeries. Patient has had multiple cesarean sections. She has had infections. These are all cases where you'll find dense bowel adhesions, dense ureteric adhesions, dense bladder adhesions. That's where uh, we find that uh, the use of uh, robot, uh, robotics in a hysterectomy makes a very big difference. Simply because here again, uh, visualization becomes easy. Now, we had a patient who had previous uh, surgery done, uh, cesarean section followed by an exploration because of an infection and used to get recurrent UTI. She actually had a, a connection of uh, a pus pocket in the adnexia to the bladder. Now, this is someone where I would expect adhesions. And as we had it, the bladder was completely distorted and adherent. But just because we had such clear vision and, you know, going very slowly with the plane of dissection, we were able to achieve a very uh, good outcome. The patient, in fact, is uh, this particular video was, in fact, awarded the first prize in uh, endoscopy video in our annual conference because it just showed how beautifully the robot was able to uh, excise all of it very easily. We've done uh, robotics uh, hysterectomy for a uh, lot of patients with very large uteruses. Our blood loss essentially is coming down to less than 100 cc now, and the time is also coming down as well. Myomectomy surgeries, again, there is a concept which has, uh, which says that you have a pseudo capsule which contains the nerve fibers and the vessels which come to the fibroid. Now, if you're doing a surgery of a fibroid removal, you don't just yank the fibroid off from the thing and put sutures and you're done with it because that, that may include the pseudo capsule. It may include a hematoma formation post-surgery. It may also reduce the healing process. Now, you, when you're doing a myomectomy and a patient wants to get pregnant, it's important to ensure that the scar has healed so well that it's able to hold a baby and go through uh, maybe labor pains if there is if it's allowed. Uh, so that's where robot assisted surgery helps because the vision is so good. We are able to see the pseudo capsule and dissect the fibroid, keeping the pseudo capsule intact, which has known uh, in various studies to increase the healing process, very little hematoma formation and a very good outcome. We are also able to do integration of images. So if you have deep intramural fibroids, you're not able to visualize them from the serosal surface and you're wondering whether it is there or not. You have an MRI mapping done pre-surgery. You keep the image of the MRI in front of you while you're doing the surgery right there in the integrated into your screen in the robotic council, uh, console, which allows you to actually map and uh, figure out where your fibroids are expected to be. So that uh, helps us to do a good dissection. Coming down to sacrocolpopexies or pelvic floor repairs, uh, we know that that is done for patients who have a pelvic organ prolapse, which is like a procedential or a very severe prolapse where uh, there is absolutely no apical support. It is done for patients who've had surgery, a hysterectomy done before and have a vault prolapse. Here, uh, sacrocolpopexy is technically a very challenging surgery to be done with the help of laparoscope also, simply because there are a lot of points where you have to adhere the mesh correctly and you have to do a lot of dissection to hold it back and pull it up to the sacral promontory. Uh, use of uh, robotics becomes ideal in this situation. This is a video of uh, a patient who was undergoing a hysterectomy with sacrocolpopexy. Traditionally, sacrocolpopexy was used for vault prolapses where you had the vaginal vault and you, you put the mesh on it. However, if you have a patient who has a procedentia and the uterus is almost all out, just doing native tissue repair is not always enough to take care of the prolapse and the patient invariably will come back with the vaginal vault uh, uh, defect. So here we do what is called as robot-assisted hysterectomy. We close the layer of the vagina in the double layer and then apply the mesh on it so that there is no chance of erosion, which is what is uh, worrying in uh, these patients. And at the same time, we are able to uh, give the patient the best outcome and no re-surgeries are required for them. So our hysterectomy is completed in its, its uh, uh, usual format. We splay the posterior part over here, open it up to the levator and I plate. This is posterior to the vagina. We are opening up the rectal vaginal septum. Uh, we look at the levator's plate exposed on both sides. Then we go ahead and apply the mesh uh, on both sides on the levator and eye. This is uh, done for patients who have a levator and eye uh, prolapse as well. Now, once we've done that, uh, this is again a patient who had had a uh, who's had a wall prolapse that is done. 
So you have to dissect your planes correctly and then apply the mesh on the sacral promontory. So the mesh has to be applied correctly and uh, uniformly placed across on the vaginal vault. So these are patients generally who are elderly, who have uh, a lot of uh, obesity. Again, obesity is one factor where robot assisted helps because the instruments of the robot actually be behave like a lateral lift. They actually lift the abdominal wall up and allow the entire uh, abdominal wall to be lifted up, which allows you to uh, operate on an obese patient. Even if the bowel is uh, coming in the way, you are able to give a good Trendlenburg position and uh, do the procedure as it is. So here we apply the mesh correctly all over on the vault and then take it up to the sacral promontory, unfold it, take it up to the sacral promontory and then we use a tacker to uh, suture it. Once the mesh has been anchored to the uh, sacral promontory, we have to uh, re-penetralize it and hide it away so that there is no bowel uh, obstruction happening post-surgery. Anatomically, this is the best procedure that you can do for a procedentia because the apical support is where uh, the loss is and this is a site-specific defect repair you've done. So at the end of five years, there is a 90% success rate of this particular surgery. And uh, at the end of 10 years, we've seen about 80 to 75% uh, uh, you know, anatomical correction still present with no, uh, with no recurrences happening over there. So sacral carpopexy becomes... Uh, the preferred method of doing this particular surgery. We've done quite a few laparoscopic as well as robot assisted surgeries and uh, you know, the change in the pelvic floor support has been consistent all throughout where we found that your uh, C, C is your vault and this is, uh, you're looking at anterior wall that is BA is anterior wall, B, <clears throat> BP is posterior wall and C is your apex, the vault. So at the end of one year also, there is a consistent uh, uh, you know, reduction of the prolapse seen in these patients. So coming on to tubal reanastomosis, I've only done uh, one case, I think with the advent of IVF, this is a surgery which is not very frequently done. And, uh, but uh, however, we've had a very good success in that one patient that we did this for. <coughs> so robotics we know is excellent, excellent for adhesion prevention. So it's excellent for fertility preserving surgeries. It uh, helps to reduce coagulation because we dissect much better. We don't have to go ahead and start using bleeders and start using uh, uh, monopolar cautery to uh, burn too much inside over there. We can do a good approximation, good suturing. And basically, it helps us to improve the outcomes in terms of uh, patient's uh, pain, in terms of patient's blood loss, in terms of even anatomical outcomes of the patient. So uh, we've uh, also uh, learned single port, though we don't have single port robotic surgery yet, but this is something that I've gone and actually <clears throat> learned from Dr. T.J. Kim in uh, Korea. Uh, the port itself is very expensive, but this is a very, very cosmetic way of doing a benign surgery. And the whole advantage of using a single port robot surgery would be that your camera is um, and your ports are going through one single port. And because you have an angulated uh, instrument, it is able to do the entire process in the surgery without actually making multiple incisions on it, on uh, the patient's one. Obesity remains one of the main indications of doing robotic surgery for us. Our highest BMI of a patient has been of 45. And uh, we all thought that this is not going to be possible. We didn't know how we we're going to go ahead and do the hysterectomy, but the robot actually helped us to do the lapro lift and we were able to very successfully complete it. So the highest BMI we've done a robotic hysterectomy is 45, which is of course she needed bariatric as well, but that's a different story altogether. But then she uh, did very well with the help of robots. So we uh, definitely, uh, used robot to help reduce hospital stay as well as patient's outcome. Of course, cost remains a concern, but now we have at least three more robots coming in in the system. As uh, uh, Other than the intuitive surgical uh, XI, X and SI, we have the CMR robot, we have the COVID-19 robot, Medtronics robot, we've got the JNJ robot coming in. We also have an Indian robot. There is an Indian uh, surgeon in the Delhi who has actually come up with an Indian robotic system cost of these is very, very minimal. So, you know, you are looking at now using this technology or method where you use three-dimensional uh, imagery with angulated instruments to do surgery for a, across the board. So I think with the use of these other three robots, the cost is automatically going to come back because when your competition increases, you have to be uh, viable enough. So the cost is now not going to be very much higher 
I think in the coming future, if you see, <clears throat> I'll just show you this. Um, so that's basically the whole plethora of what all we can do with the help of robot assisted surgery, starting with a paravaginal repair. Now, this is a pelvic floor repair, which is done for a lateral cystocele. Cystocele or a prolapse of the urinary bladder can occur because of defect in the fascia. It can be defect in the fascia in the center or in the lateral part. Lateral part is where the bladder fascia is adherent to the iliopectinal line, the condensation of fascia on the obturator internus muscle. This particular uh, surgery is uh, technically challenging simply because the pubic symphysis bones come in the front and it's difficult to manipulate sutures in this area. So when you're using the robot, you're actually able to lift the vagina up, visualize where your defect is and re-suture the vagina <coughs> laterally back to the uh, muscle on the lateral uh, wall. As you can see here, Though the access is so less, we are able to manipulate our uh, needle very well. That's the uh, facial condensation that you can see. And then you can pull the suture back inside. <clears throat> Generally, about three such sutures are required uh, to be able to approximate uh, very well in uh, this. So that's how uh, it is put in. We also do uh, generally a, a laparoscopic birch call for suspension with this particular surgery. Then the myomectomy, like I said to you, myomectomy surgery here, the pseudo capsule being uh, kept intact is extremely important for fertility outcomes. So this patient had a large anterior wall fibroid and uh, we are going to be dissecting <clears throat> this fibroid off. So. So as you can see that there is a, a capsule of the fibroid. So this section is made here to uh, dissect the fibroid off from its bed. So as you can see, it is absolutely minimal or no bleeding. This is a large nine centimeter fibroid that we are removing. So we are here dissecting and you can see here, you can actually see the endometrial cavity right there below the fibroid and uh, we are lifting the fibroid off the bed. And as long as we are keeping the capsule intact, uh, there is hardly any bleeding and this capsule being intact is what allows good healing to occur and uh, is uh, good for the outcome of this patient in terms of her pregnancy later on. So this is a very large intramural fibroid. And of course, then oppose that, we go ahead and do suturing. You can see the endometrial cavity right in the center is popping out. Suturing in this case would have to be done at least in uh, two layers. So the use of uh, sutures. Now, of course, we have what is called as barbed sutures available, which allow you approximation without putting knots. Uh, this is a more traditional way of doing surgery where you use a regular suture and put multiple interrupted sutures. But the end of it, the result is such that <coughs> you have good approximation of all layers with no uh, space left for hematoma formation. So, and then this is again, uh, more solution that is there. Um, if you see the uh, statistics of what we've done over the years, uh, starting from the first four years to the last four years up to 10, 2020 that you've seen, our uh, largest fibroid uh, was 15 centimeters initially. We've come gone up to 20 centimeters in terms of doing a myomectomy. Our uh, blood loss has significantly increased over the period of years and we've had complex surgeries as well, age in a hysterectomy. Uh, the majority number of cases that we did initially in the first four years were more for adenomyosis, fibroid uterus or DUB. And we've shifted that now in the last uh, three years to going on to doing exclusively great for endometriosis hysterectomies or very large fibroid uterus. Uh, the blood loss has significantly increased and we've had absolutely no uh, complications that would so far in the last four years in terms of this hospitalization stays also reduced. We are now more confident of sending our patients home after 24 hours of doing the surgery. In fact, patients themselves feel very, very comfortable 
after having undergone the surgery to be able to have the confidence to say yes i can go home and i don't feel anything uh, in terms of pain or any restriction of movement whatsoever in uh, excision of endometriosis uh, we are now using the robot mainly all of our cases have gone up to grade 4 where rectal shaving uh, rectal dissections disc resections of the rectum ureterolysis bladder endometriosis all of these are now addressed with the help of robot assisted uh, surgery uh, we haven't had any patient coming back with any issues so far and our blood loss was significantly reduced in these cases prolapse repair we've gone on to do what is called as levator and i fixation uh, sacro hystropexy sacro colpopexy paravaginal repairs uh, we've had only one patient with a mass erosion this is a vagina which was very uh, atrophic and uh, and uh, mesh had occurred otherwise uh we have a decent follow up of these patients and the uh, hospitalization remain the same but we've done more variety of uh, prolapse surgeries with the help of robot so um our complications are less we have had only one conversion to laparotomy and that was mainly because the patient was a very young uh, short uh, thin lady who had a very large fibroid when you have someone like that the uh, magnification of the robot which is 10 times is actually deteriorant to you because you see too much and you have absolutely no space to move so that's where this we had to convert to a laparotomy however uh, and one of them where the robot had some malfunction but otherwise we've been pretty uh, good with uh, use of robot in uh, gynecology uh, i've also been a proctor for robot surgery across india so this is where uh, this is a da vinci xi uh, training module so in uh, all of the aims they have had a robot uh, uh, installed which have a training module so this is a teaching console there are two consoles one is for the student and the other one is for the mentor and the mentor allows the student to do the surgery while watching through there and whenever it feels that they need i need i feel i need to take control i can switch off uh, the 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 so the student's uh, console and switch over and take over the surgery in my hand so this is actually probably one of the best ways i mean even in uh, like this is pretty much like how you do open surgery where you know you are there you're teaching and if the person is making a mistake you push the hand away and you say no not like this like this in laparoscopy that can be pretty difficult because how you will have to actually come across the other side to the patient's operating side and do it in the robot teaching becomes extremely easy because if i feel that there is a problem i can just switch over and stop her uh, console go over to my teaching console and show what i want to do and then the person can mirror it exactly without actually having any turnover or switch over time so uh, the teaching aspect of robot assisted surgery again is uh, very unique and i think uh, a very good way of teaching um in the uh, future we may have a situation scenario where you have the robot doing the surgery or meeting the patients or even on operation at home who knows but there are 10 reasons why you should do robotic surgery it's very precise uh, it can be used for a very large variety right from head face neck to your neck uh, to your uh, thyroids to your thoracic surgeries to abdominal esophagectomy bariatric surgery urology pelvic floor surgery groin so it pretty much from head to the groin all surgeries can be done with the help of uh, the robot it is definitely much 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 less painful as compared to even laparoscopy i would put it at a score of 2 as to 10 versus laparoscopy pain of 4 is to 10 it definitely is much less painful there is very little blood loss much quicker recovery and lesser chance of infection uh, we see a very good magnified view which is far better than what you would see in any interface it is like you're seeing right inside the patient's abdomen uh, it can reduce tremor filtration one of our speakers in the morning was speaking about tremor filtration and he said that it actually allows you to do this so for very precise surgeries where you're looking at a tubal reanastomosis you can actually filter your tremors of your hand and your movement in such a way that you can make very precise uh, cuts or very precise suturing is possible with the help of robot it's very very ergonomic so it's not just about ki i want to do robot surgery when i become old because then i can't stand and do surgery so it will be easy i don't think that is ever going to be the scenario i don't think that is the reason but i think the whole thing here is that if you are comfortable you're doing a complex surgery your state of mind is not concentrated on any physical issue that are happening with you but you are comfortable enough to give your best output to the patient obviously that is going to lead to a better outcome for the patient uh, in you know indirectly it is going to definitely get cheap, uh, cheaper like i said three more robots coming in the market this robot assisted surgery is definitely going to be a much cheaper option as compared to laparoscopy given and it's available all across india i think uh, the way forward for any robotic surgery would be to have good robotic robots robotic programs there are people who are interested and aware of what all we can do with the help of robots we need to create a lot of awareness uh, in fact we've done a study uh, in uh, my gynecopedy 
where we went across in the last three months and put a questionnaire to all our patients and asked them what they felt, what they thought was a robot assistant. Very interesting uh, answers have come up in terms of them thinking of a robot actually walking in and doing surgery to thinking it is very dangerous to some actually being knowledgeable enough to know that, okay, what it is all about. So I think awareness is also very important for that patients are accepting it much better if it is, if it is you know, good for them. Credentialing of surgeons is very important. So I think you must have a the method of credentialing just as we have for minimal access surgery that, you know, who should or should not be doing robot because ultimately robot is just an instrument. It's the person using the instrument who's going to decide the outcomes. So you should be careful of who's using it so that you get the best outcomes possible. Uh, and more amount of training centers are required. And at first they will ask you why you're doing it. And later they'll ask you how you do it. So there are three types of people, one that make things happen, those that let it happen and those who don't know what happened. So um, I'd like to just invite if there's anyone in your circle who's interested, we've started an association of gynae robotic surgeries. This is all of us gynae robotic surgeons of India, our society, and we are uh, having an annual conference. And if there's anyone who you know who has a good video who would like to go up for this cash prize, which is there from Batikuti, a $500 cash prize if your video wins, uh, welcome to send your video to us. Uh, that's the brochure. We have four international faculties coming in who are going to have an extensive workshop on use of robotics in benign as well as gynae oncology surgery. I'm the secretary of the uh, society and uh, we would look forward if you were interested to participate in this. It's going to be held at Hyderabad and it's a physical meeting. It's not an online meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anshumala. Uh, fantastic, you know. Uh, I fully agree with the last part that what you told us that it is the, uh, the, the most important the awareness, awareness and awareness. As the doctors should be aware of what can be offered to our patients. That will be the ultimate thing. And then, so this is a very, very, very enlightening thing for the doctors and the people who are attending this cinema. Our, always our aim has remained that we would like to bring on platter the most important advanced thing so that the, if the doctors are aware they can tell their patients hmm. and give them the confidence that this right. can be done and this can be done better right so thank you very much all thank these you. exercises really work thank, 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 you. thank, thank you for thank you dr thank you dr mehta thank you so okay. much so uh, we are concluding <laughs> today's session <laughs> friends uh, we are concluding today's session today uh, we will be with you again on the 7th of August where we are taking cardiology. Thank you so much and thanks for everybody. Thank you and very good day.